Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Aurora. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, Level 2, Lesson 4. It is formally titled Telepathy and the Functioning of the Higher Senses. So I'm going to be talking about the anatomy of your brow and your crown chakra, their functionality, how they function in a oops, 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 how they function in a pristine system, the way things are supposed to be, and then how this stuff has been inhibiting your natural thought structure and your natural thought behavior. And I don't know if I need to rant, I'll see if I need to rant, but I always need to make a distinction between my teachings from 10 years ago before implantation and activation of this stuff and how you could cultivate your mind and be in control of your tendril of attention and the direction of your flight through time and how very, very difficult that is right now. So I'll just start out by saying like, it's not an easy, simplistic, pat solution, just dust off your hands and everything is totally fine. Um, it was much easier in other times when all you had to face was the customary levels of genetic implantation, um, diminishment of your natural insight and thought behavior due to verbalization and cultural and religious paradigms and habits of thought and habits of um, um, uh, habits of attention. Hold on one moment, just got to do a brief pause. I want to make sure um, a person just emailed me. I want to make sure they have the link to the so yes, now you face an extra layer. Like if that wasn't enough spiritual weightlifting and muscle building for you, now you face an extra layer where you also have to um, wrest control from this thought invader thing that is attempting to um, direct, misdirect your mind literally away from ascension um, foster thoughts that foster the pathway of ascension into the periphery. So it's trying to make you throw a gutter ball in your game of spiritual bowling. If you guys know what bowling is. Um, and uh, we don't want to let that happen. But before I dive into my official curriculum, I have a fun and wonderful and awesome announcement for you all today. Yeah, wait, let me turn on your chat so I can see what you're saying. Joyce says, I had to link from last week's email. Joyce, I'm so sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. It says, I sent out the email. I promise, I promise. And I don't know why some people didn't receive it or didn't receive it correctly. So my utter apologies. Sometimes I do my email before class like late at night and sometimes I'm like bleary eyed and it doesn't go through but this time I did it at like 6 p.m I'm like I am so on top of things everything is going to go great so I'm so apologetic if the email did not go out properly because also the notes are essential and I did attach them but I checked my sent box and it looked like it went out so I don't know what what's going on Joyce has got it she says the retreat in Arizona looks magnificent so yay celebrate with me this is incredibly momentous because as, since I came here as Aurora and I've been here as a walk in like 22 years um, I've always had this envisionment of how I can effectively share who I am and what I do and my gifts in the world with humanity. And it's been um, uh, a long series of developments to be able to get to the point of like, you know, because doing a class is so wonderful. And I love sharing these intellectuality, intellectual ideas as abstractions. But doing the flying rainbow lasagna is more than just an idea or a belief system or a set of ideas. It's really a whole, I would say, a comprehensive lifestyle, a way that I do things. And I've optimized. First, I had to learn how to be in a human body. And then I had to learn like how to optimize cultivating your energy field in this bizarre culture and it's often dysfunctional culture that you live in. And then now to be articulate and have mastered um, you know, the, the art of doing lasagna in this world, in this time place, how to connect effectively. And back in 2019, I was doing lessons and I still do my Tuesday dance class now via Zoom, but I was doing it from my garage via Zoom. And then I thought like, oh, the next thing will be, you know, doing like in-person dance classes or something. And we had the pandemic and all of those desires and intentions got shelved. And then there was a lot of life disruption and world disruption. Consider this the click into alignment with optimum timelines because I am here, you are here, we are here, we are not enslaved to crapola. And I am inviting you guys to this amazing event that I'm organizing. So it is a Flying Rainbow Lasagna intensive immersive retreat 
coming up on May 13th through 16th of this year and to be held in Sedona, Arizona. So first, I want to just share with you, let's do a little share screen so I can show you, where's my goodies? It's around here somewhere. Um, okay, I'm going to turn on the desktop because I knew that there would be this has to, oh, it's right here. Good, it's right here. Hooray, 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 hooray. So um, this is uh, what you'll see when you click on my Google document. And um, first of all, Lanley Lee is uh, my organizer. You can tell Cheeky will be there has, and has helped me to set up these different websites. So, so much attention and gratitude to Lanley Lee. She's wonderful. So first of all, this is the location of where this is going to be. It is about 10 minutes outside of the city of Sedona. So I chose this very intentionally because I wanted to find, a, I love Sedona. The energy there is fantastic. The energy in California is very challenging in terms of getting flight. Like there's all these overhead power lines, consciousness suppression technology, tones of 5G frequency. It's very, very locked down. But I found a lot of freedom when I went out to um, the middle of the desert in uh, October of last year, I went to Phoenix and then I drove up to Sedona and I was able to do a lot of expansive, like imagine big wingspan type of stuff um, just because there's a lot less suppression technology out there. So um, with Landy's help, I found this beautiful retreat center. It is a large space that is outside of the city itself and in a neighborhood with plenty of room around you, you will not have neighbors directly on top of you. The whole idea is to be able to cultivate an energy field, big, giant, open blue sky, beautiful view of the surrounding mountains, um, um, uh, peaceful and away from 5G. And then here you can see large outdoor deck because uh, we dance outside whenever possible. Um, so we'll do sun gazing in the morning and sun gazing at night and actual flying rainbow lasagna dance sessions outside. Beautiful pool. We have a, a wonderful friend and student, long-term student of this class. I don't think she'll mind if I mention her name. That's Ellie. And she uh, she told me that she does weekly swimming. She swims all the time. And she loves to do flying rainbow lasagna in the pool, like swimming and spinning around in the pool, which I think is fantastic. So there's a pool there to be able to experiment with flying rainbow lasagna, aquanautics, a wonderful outdoor gathering space for casual um, campfires and indoor fireplace for this is for after the curriculum like it's really important to have time to be able to um, I'd call it storytelling share your thoughts share your life experiences get to know the other participants and that is also part of what's essential in cultivating an energy field. So we're not just gonna be miming or pantomiming the flying rainbow lasagna. It's not just empty gestures. We're gonna do a real reality, co-creation, shaping of the fabric of space, time and consciousness. You do it individually for yourself, but you also do it as part of this group. And then Sedona is an amazing place for this to radiate outward into, into the entirety of the world, the entirety of the fabric of life. And so um, I'm also intending to send people home with um, valuable skills of self-cultivation. So you can see down here, there's a wonderful exercise room that is a part of the re re retreat center. And I'm going to take everybody through some of the muscle building exercises, um, my routine. Basically, you'll be with me during the day through my routine, and I'm going to show you how to do these things. You can set up your own daily practice for cultivating your body, bringing yourself into optimum states of health, and being able to do the lasagna. And I also, I wanted you to see there's this beautiful dining room area that I chose this place very specifically with these features because I also feel that having communal meals is a big part of the wonderful opportunity. Like why would a person wish to travel in order to be able to participate in this event? Sedona itself is amazing, and I will incorporate several daily walks or light hikes into what we're doing. I call it walk and talk, because you guys can tell I walk on my treadmill all the time, and it definitely helps me as part of my natural um, you know, energy field, natural buoyancy, and also neurological regulation. So we'll do um, not grim death marches, but like the slow paced good walks where I can um, give a lecture at the same time. So that would be formal curriculum stuff. And then there will be uh, a break 
And then there will also be times when I gather everyone and I'm going to be your coach. I'm going to be your physical coach and we're going to do um, body cultivation exercises. And I just want to make it very clear. And I keep on emphasizing this. I'm not sure how um, accessible the physical structure building is if a person has like a wheelchair or some other mobility aid or something like that. Cause I think that there are steps to get into and out of the building, but in every way possible, I, I envisioned this as wanting to make it accessible to people of different ability and mobility levels. So I love super athletes. I love ballerinas. I love acro yoga people. You're absolutely invited and encouraged to be a part of this. And also if you're a person that has, you know, a, a deficit or an injury or some um, aspect of your body that doesn't work perfectly, please don't let that be something that holds you back because I always teach modified versions of whatever I do. So the coaching aspect of physical body movements is going to be tailored and customized to each person. If you can only dance from the torso up, I will show you torso up maneuvers and uh, whatever. If you have limited spinal mobility or other things or balance or coordination issues, you can still do this dance. And I want people to know that that, that is the, the spirit of what, what I offer here. So also the food, food's gonna be amazing. We have Chef Dave, his name Dave War from um, the owner and mastermind of um, Chocolate Tree in Sedona and the Giving Tree Cafe in Phoenix. Both of which are amazing places, which you should definitely go to immediately if you're in the area. Because I ate everything, I want to say everything on their menu, almost everything on their menu. Because they lasagna makes you hungry. All right. I'll just tell you that. You're using a lot of physical food as well as light food from the sky, you know, from the from the sun and the stars. And uh, I went out there in October and I did a flying rainbow lasagna expression at the cafe. And uh, they were so wonderful. And so, so um heartwarming, I don't know how to say it, treated me like family, fed me very well. So I can personally vouch for the amazing talents of Dave. And um, his cafes are vegetarian, but I'm not a vegetarian and the retreat is not formally vegetarian. So basically imagine all of these wonderful vegetarian options, but always with like some grilled chicken or something like that on the side for me and for anyone else. So gonna have amazing food for both your um, light body, and for your physical body. And then also there's a variety of different accommodations. And when you check out the, the document that I'll share, like the little link for being able to um, find all the details, you'll see the different, the range in price because the least expensive thing you can do is go there with your own tent and gear and camp, which will be beautiful and amazing. And of course you can still have access to the bathrooms and the kitchen and amenities inside. You would simply sleep outside to the most you know, luxurious or whatever you'd like to call it, the nicest, which is the king suite, a room with a door that closes and a big, beautiful king bed. So um, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be an amazing, exalted experience. I'm so excited to do it because literally supernatural miracle that I'm still here, that I'm still lasagna that we still have our minds and our capacitations, we are not assimilated into the Borg. Um, let's celebrate that. And I think that this will be um, historical and amazing. So um, yes, in invitation, encouragement and celebration. And also, so um, the travel costs are not included in the, the um, price that you'll, you'll find uh, on the website. If you want to know the price, the basics to participate, $1,000 plus $350 for the meals. It's four days and three nights. And then a different range of um, add-ons for accommodations, depending upon least expensive is camping, which is like $200. And then the most expensive is the King Suite, which is like 3,500 bucks. Boom. And you can check out all the details there and figure out what's in your budget. It doesn't include the cost of travel. So if you're traveling and you are able to get to the airport, um, we will shuttle you and bring you over to the retreat center because there's a limited number of cars that we can bring there. Um, it, like Sedona definitely um, protects its sanity and privacy and doesn't want to have like lots of cars, loud parties and different things like that. So we're a different type of gathering. But we want to be respectful of the number of vehicles that are going to be at the center. So we'll make sure to um, accommodate to everyone with that. So get yourself on over there. Or if you are already a person that lives in the area and you want to be able to come for the events but then go and sleep at home of course you would only pay the foundation price and the meal plan price and you would not have to pay for accommodations so all of that i'm super duper duper excited and um that's that's my that's my house cleaning for today 
then on to the curriculum, let's get serious. Even though that's serious. And I think also like, I, I want you guys to know, I look forward to connecting with people through that retreat on a very personal level that um, sometimes in class here, I share some of my life experiences of what, what, what I've been through and my perspective, especially some of my funny walk-in stories. There will be an opportunity for me to do that a lot. I think it will be really wonderful to be able to share not only my lifestyle, my daily activities, the ways of cultivating lasagna, but also to be able to share more of myself, who I am as a person, and um, to get to know people in friendship. I think that that will be really priceless. So um, yeah, invitation and um, no, no, not March, 2025, May 2024. So that's in about three months. It's uh, the middle of May of this year. All right. And other people might also want to know what about like if a couple goes, how would the, the you know, accommodations work for that? Each individual person would pay the foundation participation cost and meal plan. But then if you rent a suite, or like, you know, if you have a, a queen room or something like that, two people can split the cost of one room. So you, you figure that out. So um, yeah, to totally fine, good for couples. And I think that it would be actually a wonderful experience. So there's basically like a, a king suite, two queen suites. Then there's a large room that has several bunk beds and a very large king bed. I'm going to take a bunk bed. I'm going to sleep in that room. I'm calling that the summer camp experience where we all are in our pajamas together. I don't want to say that we're sleeping together because it's not that type of a situation, guys. Truly, truly. But we are sleeping in the same room. You will see me in my pajamas. And Cheeky's going to be there, of course, now. Cheeky's in bed right now. She's not feeling that good. She has a tummy ache and it's raining out and she's just not feeling her usual self. Didn't really want to eat her breakfast. So we'll see if she wakes up during class. But she's absolutely essential. She's an ascended master in dog form. She's going to be a part of the uh, wonderful retreat and celebration over there. So again, if you are a highly allergic person or if you cannot bear to be around dog hair, it might not be the best situation for you to participate because um, Cheeky's going to be part of the event and i'm gonna sleep in a bunk bed with all with not with you guys but right next to all of you guys and cheeky's gonna sleep with me that's my ground rule as i'll say if cheeky's sleeping in somebody else's bed that's like cheating on me we can't have that in a relationship so that's my only ground rule but um you can hug and kiss her as much as you want and um so thank you thank you for my my lightheartedness there but we're, we're very very excited to be planning this all out so now on to the curriculum for the day, talking about telepathy and the functioning of the higher senses. This relates to your journey as an ascended master in training. And this also relates to what it is like to become a galactic citizen. Because when you activate your true love-based telepathy, I call it the time phone. It is a mind phone. Like you can call someone on the phone, but you use your mind and you can call anyone anywhere at any time. And this means that you are able to connect with um, far distant individuals and civilizations. You could call and connect with a star civilization or let's say other a group of otherworldly beings that don't live here in this time place that would be relative to you because time language is going to get very difficult right now. They could be from 10,000 years in your past or 10 million years in your future. And sometimes that is necessary to do in order to have a real-time communication because I'm going to talk in today's class all about how Einstein was an amazing teacher for his, his time, his era, uplifting and expanding the human conception of what the cosmos is shaped like but also gave you a glass ceiling, a limit beyond which it is proposed, it is not possible to expand. And that ceiling or that limit is called the speed of light. And Einstein's worldview and calculations and the current scientific outgrowth as a result of that states that it is not possible to go faster than the speed of light. And that mindset and presumption has held humanity in a state of encapsulation apart from um, being able to connect effectively the past and the future, 
So I did talk about that with my analogy last week in class, I think with the little ant, the little ant on the inside of the time bubble, the little ant on the outside of the time bubble, the presumption of the ever expanding bubble of time that is known as the Big Bang and then the event horizon that you presently live on, like the surface of an ever expanding bubble and uh, the limitations. Like that there's there technically, according to that worldview, there's nothing beyond the bubble. There's no future, not nihilistically, but in the sense of like, there's nothing there because it hasn't been even created yet. And so then of course you can't interact with or gain energy from something that doesn't exist yet. This is the logicality that derives from Einstein's cosmology and his assertions. So he gave humanity some benevolent upgrades, but they also came with limitations. Uh, you know, the turkey is a little dry. You got the turkey sandwich, but the turkey is a little dry. So uh, I am here to bust through that glass ceiling for you because in order to be a meaningfully connected galactic citizen, you cannot obey something like the limit of the speed of light because you're gonna have to send and receive signals much faster in order for things to be relevant and coordinated in the larger cosmic symphony. So there is a galactic center. Uh, each galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center that is a gravitational, um, what do you call it, glue, but it is an epicenter around which everything is uh, relevant, relates to everything in that center. And you could consider that to be the great conductor. Like there is God who is the great conductor, the composer, the conductor, creating and generating, sustaining and organizing all of this. The galactic center is you know, an outgrowth of that, an organizational principle that organizes each of the stars and each of the star systems in the galaxy. And each star itself is a conductor because each star has its own emanations that come outward and that create, I didn't have to jump up to get my sculpture today. I had it right here, your energy body, AKA your light body aka your time body, this chakra that is shaped by the um, pulsating and moving um, areas of awareness through fields of possibility and probability. The sun doesn't just emit optical light, although it emits optical light, it also emits timelines and probability statistics, the potentials of your life and what is known as your personal energy field. So your personal energy field is a direct connection to the thought structure of the sun in your sky. And the sun in your sky is connected to the galactic center. And our star, Sol, S-O-L, of the solar system here, is far away from the galactic center. Like we live on a peripheral dirt road out in the middle of Nowheresville, and it takes a very long time to drive there if you're following the speed of light. So think of the galactic center as a brain. And think of us over here, like at the elbow, or like down on your big toe. And it would take a very, very, very long amount of time for a signal through the speed of light to go all the way here to the brain, from the brain to you, and then to experience it here, and then to send back feedback and be like back to the brain, like, oh, like this is what we're experiencing here in this time place. And there would be so much of a lag in communication that it would make communication almost um, impossible or laughably um, just irrelevant. Really, thank you very much for that message. I'm dead now. It doesn't matter anymore. Like by the time these messages go back and forth, um, there's just no coordination. And that's no way to run a symphony because both the sun and the galactic center have um, a, 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 a commitment to keeping the beat and keeping the pace. Organizing life means um, keeping the percussive momentum of all of the events that are happening. And so communication is very important in terms of coordinating, just like you, you keep in the, the drummer keeps the beat. The sun and the galactic center keep the beat of the music of life. And that's essential for us to follow as we are musicians in the band. So we are life forms, biological life forms. And I'll make a big distinction between who we are as biological life forms and this stuff that's not biological life forms. 
um, we are biological life forms. We are like the art projects or emanations of the sun and the entire star systems. So the sun is like an artist in the workshop creating life. That's us. And each sun, each star out there gets to create its own, you know, um, creations. I didn't have a different synonym there. Its own expressions of life. And then the idea is that each of those expressions of life in the physical, biological form in all of these various different um, contexts around different star systems comes through levels of refinement and self-exploration and reaches the point where the higher faculties are awakened naturally. And that journey of developing as an organism organizing your light body, organizing all of the chakras on your body so that they um, in, inter, interweave effectively and transmit energy effectively, and then gaining the capacity to have pure insight and reach across time. That's an attainment, just like um, powers of speech or other powers of movement. Um, you go through these levels of evolution to become worthy of gaining those powers. Not that you're evil, bad, or in other ways unworthy in that sense, but that wisdom must be attained through your growth and evolution process to use your faculties well. So in my um, notes from 10 years ago, I use a pretty good analogy. I talk about when you're a little tiny baby versus being a toddler versus being an adult. So you guys are infants of consciousness. Don't have any attitude about it. It's fine. It's fine and it's good. What it is to be an infant of consciousness as it relates to your light body. It's like when you were a little tiny baby, when you first came here as a human, you're like having a body container, but you didn't know how to use it. Like you wore a diaper because you didn't know how to control your sphinc sphincters. Huh? All right. And also sometimes when you ate food, you didn't know how to keep the food in. Sometimes the food came out. Took a little while for you to even figure out your digestive tract. You hadn't even yet figured out your complex central nervous system to be able to coordinate all of your arms and legs and stand up and balance. That is the level of expression that you're at right now. Just accept it and celebrate it, it's fine. Because with your light body, most of you are not yet even aware of what is your anatomy. What are these parts of yourself that extend beyond the physical world into a non-physical world that you might be aware of them. You might receive sensations from those areas of self, but you might not yet know how to recognize them or coordinate them. I have to mute you, not because I don't love you. There we go. Good job. Um, wait, good, good, <laughs> good, good, good. So wait, first, this is a very relevant um, um, comment. Thank you, Mary, for being here. It says tachyons are faster than the speed of light. Thank you very much for that. And I think that that's an important um, reminder and um, uh, amplifier because science as an outgrowth from Einstein's original teachings has had to figure out some way to be like, well, wait, it seems like some things are going faster than light and how can this whole thing be happening? So they are figuring out different ways of cobbling together uh, concepts that explain how things can go faster than light or how they can be apparent faster than light experiences in the face of Einstein's assertions. So they haven't fully abandoned Einstein and his description of the structure of reality, but they're having to augment it because it's like, but wait, what about this? And what about this? So tachyons is one concept of that. And then I'll also say there is I would call it extraterrestrial or reverse engineered technology that is being used and deployed um, on our planet right now, in this world right now, that is called FTL, faster than light. And those are forms of movement or transportation and also communication. And that that is actually being utilized by secret aspects of our government. It would be considered non-disclosed forms of technology undisclosed in what it is, what it's doing, who's using it and where it comes from and who in the world knows how much it costs. Let's just say that. If you're, if you're wondering where your tax dollars go, sometimes they go into things like this, but um, FTL is a real thing and it's um, incredibly advanced and those factions that utilize it here in this world, 
have uh, su supremacy over um, the uh, diminished people that are still living under the glass ceiling of the presumption that nothing can go faster than light. Um, and for F their FTL communications, I mean, it's used largely for like military and um, intelligence agencies, this undisclosed, but here, just as a fun brief anecdote, it's early in class and I'm already like getting, getting um, casual and sharing fun anecdotes with you. But when I lived in Northern California, I had a friend who was an older gentleman, an ex-engineer, and he used to build roadsters and have like kind of a hobbyist club with a bunch of other engineers, um, seeing how they could make cars faster and super fuel efficient, right? So they were working with this thing called the J cell. And this is also kind of like, I hope that saying these words doesn't flag my video or anything like that, but um, kind of an unusual contraption. The owner, I think, died under mysterious circumstances, but they it was an augment that they could put on a regular combustion car engine. And they were running that car up and down like the California Pacific Coast Highway. And every time they did so, they would get visits overhead from black helicopters. And they started to realize like, oh, like we're really getting some attention by doing this. And they realized also they should stop. And I don't know if someone overtly told them, but they did. Um, but every time they ran that J cell, it disrupted the FTL communication systems. And that was why the guys in the black helicopters weren't very happy that my friend was doing this. So again, the official objective materialist science world of Earth's surface humans um, asserts that they believe in Einstein and his proposals and that faster than light things cannot exist, but many other aspects of your government and many power abusers know that faster than light stuff is possible and they utilize it to their advantage. And they are part of the, I should say the foil of what I was talking to you about a moment ago, technology using um, extraterrestrials and otherworldly creatures. So there's a very intentional um, firewall that has been created by the creator, by God, who is a super intelligent genius, um, to prevent power abusers from expanding out of their territory. And that's the idea that like, if you haven't worked out your stuff, your tendency to abuse power and not be able to live effectively in community of consciousness, um, then you shouldn't get off your planet. You should stay in your playpen until you're ready to get out onto the larger playground and play with others because you don't know how to do it correctly yet. So the idea is that through the journey of attaining wisdom and attaining the facility of the use of your higher faculties, that you have a pr proper value system. It is called growing up, that you learn and you grow and you become a good person, but not a good person, quote unquote, ac according to random or arbitrary um assertions or cultural paradigms of what it is to be good because in some places on earth you're a bad person if you show the sole of your foot you'll get beaten get the the shoe police are going to come at you and they're going to beat you don't show the bottoms of your feet and in other places it is totally polite to slurp your noodles loudly in fact you must slurp your noodles loudly and you must belch after your meal and if you do not it is a huge insult these are arbitrary assertions not universal values but there are universal values in terms of behavioralism and living in community and it has everything to do with coordinating with the music of life from the great composer and the great conductor and that if you don't um conform to those values it means that you don't support life that's it's very very big stuff so it's not just a question of like um whether you drink with your pinkies up or whether you are you know, a polite member of society, it really is about whether you are behaving and doing things that keep you alive and continue to sustain consciousness itself, biological life itself, and the fabric of reality. Like there are very, very real um, considerations that these paradigms are based upon. So if you haven't yet mastered and embodied that value system, it is essential to stay in your own world, on your own planet, and I want to say, figure it the F on out. Instead of using an artificial augmentation, a form of technology to leapfrog over all of the lessons that you must learn to achieve your higher faculties naturally, and then go around doing nonsense and making doo-doos in places that you shouldn't do them. 
um, which is what a lot of technology using space races have done. So today there was this post on Facebook that someone was like showing this picture of all these different types of aliens. And some of them were like bird people or lizard people or whatever, but they all had like two arms and two legs and one face and two eyes. And I'm like, that's kind of not how it works, guys. But they didn't have like a whole lot of time to type out a whole answer. But um, the range, range of life that is out there is immense and probably incomprehensible to you in your present level of neurology. So we're going to talk also about natural telepathy and how it is, uh, there's like a translator that allows you to be able to speak to otherworldly creatures. Like you can talk to a tree. A tree is not a hominid biped. It doesn't look like a humanoid, but they're right there. Like I have an otherworldly creature right outside of my window. I have a fern right here in front of my computer. And uh, I talk to it actually all the time while I'm doing my work and I'm walking on my treadmill here. It doesn't have a face. So there's inborn biological predispositions and presumptions about what is life and that it's got to look kind of like you. That is the essence of anthropocentrism. And that is the viewpoint achieved through looking out only through the human lens, which is associated with your third eye. Let's get to some anatomy pictures now. So now I can make this go down and now I can show, wait, I, I'm sorry if this privacy didn't want that to flash. Okay, good. Um, I just like to preserve people's privacy. Third eye, your third eye. So your third eye is not exactly synonymous with your pineal gland, although it occupies roughly the same area of your skull. It is a place that is at the center of your skull uh, at the where the, the top of your spine and your skull, you know, actual cranium meet. It is behind your nose, not your upper forehead, but really kind of behind the bridge of your nose. And if you could triangulate also coming inward at the side of your ears, kind of where your, your glasses, where your sunglasses go around your ears, if you can triangulate inward to the center of your being there, that is where you will find not only your brow chakra. And you can see how this rotating vortex makes kind of a lens in front of the face of the figure that is here, but also your crown chakra, which is why I have this um, sketch over here. Let's see if I can make it go a little bit bigger. That is awesome. This is actually not a sketch. This I hope you can see it. This is a, a, a scratch board, like it's etched. So uh, the lines are incised into clay. So that is a really accurate representation of how the vortex of your crown chakra and the vortex of your brow chakra, which is like a lens in front of your face, they meet right at this place in the center of your being. And it's a very, very fateful and incredibly important aspect of your energy anatomy because your viewpoint of reality and your ability to see and sense and know and communicate on a higher dimensional level is not just your brow, it's not just your eyes, it's also your crown, which is your connection to higher self, highest self and God, the divine presence and who, whom you will be in a future time. And it's the interplay of those two force fields in your mind that gives you your true mind. These are also really good art pieces because they say a lot even beyond my words, but I'll describe it for you. And of course, anybody who's listening to the podcast version will benefit. But this little sketch over here is a little um, <laughs> pencil sketch from my sketchbook, but sometimes there's the best ones for me to share with you. You can see there's a larger figure of a face that's a humanoid face. And then there is the center, it's like a central sun. That is where the inner eye is. So your inner eye is both your brow and your crown coming together. And then you can see these smaller um, ghostly forms that are all diving head first into that inner sun or they radiate outward like the spokes of uh, petals of a flower. And that those are other, uh, I want to say other aspects of yourself. They appear, they're other people other people and other times and places and even of other species that are all connected to you through your eye of time, through your mind's eye. So your mind's eye is not merely your imaginative center, although it is that. It is not merely 
um, something that is used to be able to um, envision, to imagine and envision. You know, like if I asked you to imagine a purple cupcake, I would say that as the, my example in class. And we imagine something into being. So if I imagine you guys, like you could close your eyes, or you can keep your eyes open, but just bring to your mind a picture of a purple cupcake. Just you're inventing purple cupcakes and one day we'll be in the world of instant manifestation and it will be like buried in purple cupcakes. It's like, oh, here's all those cupcakes that you asked us to imagine. So please imagine delicious ones. They got to be healthy and good. But if you envision whatever, purple cupcakes or rainbow umbrellas or whatever it is, that is the inner movie screen that you are using to uh, envision that imagery. And then also that imagery creates an imprint in reality and makes those things happen. So the, we're talking about the, the mechanism through which you can be hugely empowered to create reality. This is why you must um, cultivate the correct value system and behavioral approach and worldview to use your powers wisely, to use your powers in a non-destructive way, because you need to be able to not only manifest or make purple cupcakes because you like them, you must manifest and create things that are benevolent and supportive of life everywhere. And this is part of the privilege of being able to communicate beyond the boundaries of your own planet or here now time space paradigm and uh, communicate and send out your own stuff and to receive information and inspiration from other time places. This um, sketch is really um, to exemplify the concept that all of this is you. Like um, there was a show on Netflix that it's not a total endorsement of that show because like many Netflix things, it had weird sex stuff in there and I'm just really not advocating for any of that, but it was called Sense8. And it was a science fiction show about people who were connected, groups of eight people who were connected um, through a supernatural event and through their genetic proclivities and they could feel and sense what was happening in each other's lives and that they became very, of course, emotionally connected and caring. When a person was in a crisis, they could tell. And then one guy is like, I'm gonna send my Kung Fu uh, capacities to this person so they can defend themselves. Or I'm gonna send my problem computer hacking capacities to this person. They shared a common mind. Eight individual people connected through their natural telepathy and their genetic proclivities, and they shared a common mind. That's all you need to know about that show. You can delve if you want to, if you find it entertaining, but don't endorse orgies. That's all I'm trying to say. Dun, 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 the end. Um, but because this is not about a cosmic sex show in any way. But this is about connecting to all of these different aspects of you. For example, some of these figures in this um, picture here could be you from 10,000 years ago, but maybe it's not 10,000 years ago on earth. Maybe it's 10,000 years ago on another planet. And maybe your consciousness has evolved from where you lived on that planet to where you presently live on this planet. This is why um, our languaging for time that is linear becomes wholly inadequate to really describe the depths and profundity of your experience of consciousness moving through not only time, but also multi-dimensions, because this time phone that is your higher faculties allows you to connect with places that are far distant in both space and time, and that includes other dimensions. That means other versions of yourself. So you could talk with, a, speak with a version of yourself who uh, you know, li lives in a parallel reality. So it's still you, same you, same incarnation, same time space, but different um, parallel reality, different shape of their world. And you can also connect effectively with whom you were in a totally different time that that species and world might be um, extinct at this point. That might be extinct and your consciousness isn't there, but you can talk with who you were all the way back then. And it's a real-time broadcast. It's not like you have to call someone on the phone, wait for a message, and the message can take several years and then get the message and then respond to it. 
It's right now. It's right now. In fact, you can communicate even beyond the time lag of words and verbalization and simply receive genetic or consciousness-based information from your connectivity with all of those aspects of self. And it's like a dandelion's head, like a dandelion seed head. I don't know if you all have those plants where you live, but it creates a central seed pod with many different little fluffs that stick off all around. It's spherical. And you are this central experiencer. And then all of these ra radial spokes that stick off are all of these different amazing aspects of self. And some of them are humanoid. This is back to my semi rant about the picture on Facebook. But some of them are not humanoid. <laughs> Some of them look really different than you and they don't have two arms and they don't have two legs and they don't have a face and they don't have two eyes and it's still you. So the muscle building exercises that you do here on your planet are to initially form bonds of communication and respectful interactions with things like a fern, a potted plant or a tree outside so that you can learn how to connect with and speak with life and organisms that don't look exactly like you. If you're only looking at the world through the human anthropocentric lens, then you kind of expect and need for everybody to fit into the box of two arms, two legs, and one face and two eyes. I jokingly call these the Star Trek aliens because you know the Star Trek TV show, they did it like in the 1960s or whatever. They didn't have a lot of special effects back then. And so they just would take a human actor and then they would kind of like paint some blue makeup on them and then put a little funny hat on them and say like, that's an alien. That's the level of what you're doing through the anthropocentric lens. It's laughably inadequate but I'm not making fun of you because it happens from your level of development. So you gotta level up in order to be able to respectfully recognize and communicate with otherworldly life forms. And that includes pure energy beings like I'm Aurora. I'm a pure energy being. Right now I have a face. That's the fun thing. Um, but usually I don't. And that's why I'm here in this body so that I can communicate to you effectively through the flapping of my moving mouth parts, and facial expressions, because ordinarily we don't do that. Got it? Um, and um, there are cloud-based or less dense beings, and some of them live in your own solar system, like on Jupiter, but you can't have a conversation with them because they don't have a face and two eyes, and so you don't necessarily see them as people. This is actually at the heart of a lot of the work that I do, where I paint these abstractions. These abstractions are not just like mathematical abstractions, they're people, they're alive. And when you get to the highest dimensional viewpoint, I'm always pointing up here at the very top of my head, it goes beyond anthropocentrism and into universality. And that is when you are effectively using your higher faculties as a translation device, where what you send out is a signal of communication that is empirical, meaning uninterpreted, just truth. And then that impulse comes to another organism and it goes through their layers of interpretation and is translated into something that they can perceive. Because even your five senses as a biological human do not translate as a direct analog to every species on your planet, much less to every species or otherworldly level of creature out there. So you have optical eyesight, but there's a lot of <laughs> animals on your planet right now that don't have good eyesight. Everything from moles that bury under the ground and like fish that live in underground rivers, worms, <laughs> all sorts of things don't have eyeballs or effective eyesight. So if you are a predominantly visual um, you know, organism and creature and you're trying to talk to something that doesn't have eyeballs about the colors of the rainbow, like it's not gonna get it, not gonna get it. And this is also why coming here into the physicality of you know, being a human, I had to calibrate. It took a couple of years for me to calibrate to how do I translate cosmic empirical truth into a form that is palatable to humans? I had to learn even about how to create artwork and visual diagrams that would be um, expressive and correctly interpreted 
by you as the viewers, like, is this getting across to them? So I did have to kind of change and shift and recalibrate um, my whole visual expression um, to tailor it and customize it to what is um, what is accessible. Because my, my um, intention and journey has always been more than about just self-pleasure. It's not just about like, I make this painting because I like it, which like, that's fine. And you know, if you're a human artist, and you're like, yes, I just make art for art's sake and for me. And like, I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm like, that is great. Fantastic. Good for you. Because that's the spirit of what creativity is. But I came around a very specific mission where I'm like, I have a lot of information. How do I get you guys to access that information? So it's not enough for just me to make paintings that please me. Although I must do that as an artist and, you know, um, a creative person. I must, um, you know, be engaged with and love what I create and think that it looks beautiful. I also must integrate somehow into the culture that I'm in so that the message that I'm trying to convey is received effectively by my audience, by the people that look at my stuff. And also when I make videos or when I make music, which came later than my, um, my visual expressions. I'm always grooving on my music. I do it because I love it. I do it for me, but I also do it to convey something to the people around me that uh, I'm hoping is getting a message through. And then I send out these messages, message in a bottle, that song. I didn't write that song, Sting did. I send out these messages in a bottle. And then I'm like, okay, is there anybody out there? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And sometimes, especially in my earlier years, I faltered a little bit where I'm like, does anybody get what I'm talking about? And then um, much more now, because I'm connected to, I think, some of the best people in the world, including you guys that are here in my class, um, the people receive and reflect back. Like Aurora, we hear you and we get it. Yes. So that's um, hugely gratifying and makes me feel very, very happy and successful in the artistic expressions that I'm doing here. Because, you know, I'm here uh, for a purpose and for a mission to be able to impart this information to you. And so this is also about interdimensional ethics, because when you share information with the person, you literally change their direction through time. So what is it that makes us go on a particular timeline? The answer is, it is your tendril of attention. So you could imagine a, an anatomical piece of equipment, I don't have the word for it, but a part of your body that sticks forward from your, your mind's eye. And it's kind of like a hand or like a elephant's trunk. It's a sensory organ. And that sensory organ is what you touch upon. It is your attention. So this is the class, the, the, the lesson where I teach you about the origin of the word attention. It comes from the word attenuos in Greek, meaning to reach out. Your mind reaches out. The act of placing your attention on something is literally the act of learning to control your energy body. You're a little tiny infant and you have this attention. And it's just like when you're a little baby and you're born here in the world and you're lying in your crib and you're like, your arms go all over the place, your legs go all over the place. You don't know what to do and you bite your own hand. It's like you're not in control of your limbs. That is how most humans have lived in terms of their attention, their mind, their concentration, and also where they're going in time, flailing around. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. Sometimes you bite your own hand, all right? Um, there's no, there's no shame in that. You're at that level of development. And then um, it is my absolute intention through what I share here to help humanity to become aware of your energetic anatomy, to know what it is, to learn what it's doing and to begin to cultivate it through good values into greater levels of capacitation and to become a toddler. I jokingly, but accurately refer to myself as a toddler because like a human child, I'm aware of my body. I'm like, I know who's me and who's not me. I know what I am. I'm moving my arms and my legs. And I'm also running around and making a big mess. <laughs> I'm doing stuff. I'm doing stuff. Um, but, you know, adulthood, maybe I'm not a toddler. Maybe I'm a little older than a toddler. Um, adulthood would be considered to you ascended mastery. That is the transcendence of physical experience. And although I am, you know, I have done that in my previous concurrent existence in Atlantis, here now, I am not yet at that level. 
for a reason because I got to have a mouth with flapping, moving mouth parts so I can talk to you guys and tell you about all this. And it's also something to be celebrated. Like I'm here and I have ego, motivational desires, and I have a sense of personhood, and I have things that are important for me to accomplish. Those are the things that keep a person in a state of being, like in a physical incarnation. So I know a lot of people here are not, ple not pleased with your physical incarnation. And that's why you're like, somebody get me out of here, whatever the escapism is. If it's like, you friendly UFO, take me away, fly to another world, get out of here, whatever, D dig an underground city and live in it. Like you're like, you hate your life, you wanna get away from here. This is not what I'm advocating for, <laughs> definitely not. Because the idea is through um, personal mastery and self-empowerment, you get to improve the quality of your life. Um, but um, this is uh, very much about when you um, accomplish all that your personhood and that your ego requires, you don't have a reason for being here anymore, essentially. And I have a reason for being here. Where's my lasagna? Reason for being here, not just to come in here and prove that it can be done, but also to communicate this capacity to humanity and to communicate it effectively enough so that you can save a lot of um, difficulty of trial and error and figuring things out and get, get up to speed and begin using it effectively. That's my ego desire. And that is what um, sustains my personhood here. And so um, that that's why I'm here. If you're ever like, oh, why are you still here? Like I have a job to do and I'm doing it. And it's my job joy is my cosmic job joy. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be doing it. Although sometimes like you, life is uncomfortable. And sometimes like you, I might feel like I don't enjoy the suffering part. Definitely want quality of life to be improved. Um, but I am, uh, um, uh, you know, benevolently positioned in that. I know my mission. I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. And I have very clear memories of um, making the choice to be here. So I have to make this distinction because a lot of you are always looking at the sky and you're like this. You're like, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> you don't like your life and you think you must have done something very, very wrong to be down here in this situation. And I just want to confirm to you, you're not here being punished. You didn't get smacked down like some God looked at you and was like, you're bad and wrong. This is my God face. You're bad and you're wrong. Smack down. You're going to get down there and you're going to suffer. You know, this, that's not, that is not what has happened to you, but you have internalized that sense of victimhood, injustice, and unfairness. And you are in a very unfair state. Each one of you is an innocent and you came here actually on a very, very different mission and purpose that has been largely subverted by a variety of challenges that you face in this world here now. Some of those are ancient challenges. Some of those are newly emerging challenges, um, but they're all crap, crap, crappy, but we have solutions. Let me just get a little bit more water. Hold on one moment. Sorry, I have to walk all the way back here for this. My wonderful, blessed, structured water over here, drinking it out of my Shunbed mug. Okay. So a little tiny baby sits in its crib and it kind of has sensory experiences, but not that much motor control and doesn't really know what's going on. This is what's going on with you and your light body, which is also your body of time. And a toddler has mastered some motor control, but not everything. Toddlers, like they can't exactly tie their shoes. They can't exactly write their name. They uh, try to, you know, um, oh, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Toddlers are not exactly perfect at like pouring a glass of juice. Like they spill their glass, they throw stuff on the ground all the time to the point that my dog knows to like follow toddlers around town because they throw Cheerios and goldfish crackers and other things on the ground. Just like, I'm gonna clean up, it's gonna be great. Um, smart dog, right? <laughs> but um, toddlers have some amount of self-volition and are able to begin exploring their environment and are able to begin receiving the lessons of what happens when you have an impact on your environment. So it's when the value system of right and wrong or behavioralism, what you should and shouldn't do, begins to be formed in toddlerhood. Like you're set, usually the people that um, are looking after you um, set very clear boundaries. Like 
um, you're allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this. And if you do something that's not allowed, then there are consequences. So I don't have my own physical children, but I have done a lot of babysitting and nanny work. I did that mostly in like the first 10 years that I was here as Aurora. And I worked with some really wonderful children and some of them were three years old. And, you know, I learned a lot about human development. Um, but um, setting boundaries is a sign of love. This is what I learned. And I also learned a little bit about human human tendencies and human behavior because, um, you know, you say to a little three-year-old, like, you're not allowed to touch this table, like a glass coffee table, right? Dangerous. Say like, you're not allowed to touch this table. The very first thing they do is walk over to it. This little girl walking over to it and she's going to touch it. And I look over my shoulder. I'm like, I just told you, you're not allowed to touch that table. Setting a boundary is a sign of love. And then enforcing that boundary is similarly a sign of love. And also the rules of what na Nanny Aurora's rules were always um, non-arbitrary. Like there was a reason you're not allowed to touch that table because it's dangerous. You're not allowed to play over there because that's dangerous. You're not allowed to do that because that could hurt yourself or another. So please translate that into your expression and exploration of yourself as a natural telepath, reaching into other people's minds, affecting the fabric of time, space, and reality directly, and being a powerful manifester and co-creator. Setting boundaries is a sign of love and enforcing those boundaries is a sign of love. And mostly the prohibited behaviors have to do with um, harm. Like you don't want to harm you or to harm others and that you don't have to whatever slice your hand open on a glass coffee table uh, and have that be the way that you learn. You don't have to have a hard fall, like do something with your mind and then receive negative blowback in order to learn from it. And that's, that's the whole idea is suffering avoidance. So the stages of development from becoming a little tiny infant into becoming a toddler. And then I would say maybe I'm more of a preteen or a young adult, maybe not a toddler because um, flying rainbow lasagna is a form of mastery over the construction of space-time reality. And when you're a teenager and a young adult, what happens is you begin to explore independence where you make your own choices um, independently from the value system and oversight of your parents. And you begin to integrate with the larger structure of social reality outside of your family. So that would mean going off planet. Like when you're interacting with um, other people at school or in the world of commerce or in your town, and then you are responsible for the things that you do. So you might also, you might have a job, like get a part-time job, or you might be going to school or have some areas of responsibility, and you have to follow those areas of responsibility. And these are necessary stages of personal growth and evolution to the point of being able to become an adult. And again, an adult in this perspective to you, submerged in time, would be like becoming a uh, ascended master where you no longer have physicality. You eat for sunlight all the time. I just ate hamburgers for lunch. You do not eat hamburgers for lunch. And you also have a very different um, motivation because like when you don't have to be motivated by the need to put food inside of here, um, you just have a, a completely different um, uh, shift. Like the entire lens shifts in what are your priorities and what's important for you to do and to experience. And um, you are also much more in, in freedom when you are an adult, not bound by the limits of physicality. This is not just about escapism. It is really about expanded empowerment. And that expanded empowerment must encompass the knowledge that all of these, there's multifaceted levels of extraterrestrial and extra dimensional experience. Technically, all of it is you. You must achieve unity consciousness to really know how on a profound level, all of that is you. Knowing that all of it is you does not mean that you get to harm any of it. Can't use that as a justification. Like I have pierced ears, right? So be like, it's my earlobe. I can pierce my ear, which kind of hurts a little bit, you know? Um, but I'm not allowed to pierce that guy's ear because his earlobe is his own, right? But if I'm like, that guy is me and I am you and you are me, then I'm going to pierce your earlobe. This becomes a quagmire. But when you get to higher levels of true perception, 
you can see beyond the quagmire. And there are not ethical pitfalls in all of these questions about whether you're acting in freedom, whether someone else is acting in freedom, whether you're allowed to do something, whether you're not allowed to do something, um, because your perception changes, your conception of what is self, you essentially dilate your identity to the entirety, and then you treat the entirety in a loving way. Truth is, none of us would have pierced ears. The only reason I have pierced ears is because they came with my body. I'm like, we're going to keep them, but I haven't put any new holes in my body because I'm not into doing stuff like that. But um, your entire value system would be about fostering life. Um, keeping things alive, including the system of time space itself, including um, the entire fabric of time. You become devoted to not only sustaining your own health and vitality, not only your community or those that look like you or that you identify with as yourself, but really the totality. And um, in your world here, you're like, well, what if I see that tree is me and I'm that tree, then how in the world am I going to chop down a tree in order to be able to start a campfire to stay warm? You got it because you're in the level of materialism where you got to start a campfire to stay warm. But when you get into higher levels of psychic capacitation, you don't have to start a campfire in order to stay warm. So it becomes a lot easier to live respectfully without having to remove the life force energy from another organism to sustain your own life force it becomes um, much more possible to live in those levels of uh, respectful interdependence. So I'm moving fast on my treadmill and in my mouth, I want to say these things. Pedro says, Einstein didn't have the formula for consciousness and didn't know consciousness is faster than light. Thank you, Pedro. You're fantastic. You're a wonderful long-term student and you make a great point. Einstein, like many objective materialist scientists, could not account for consciousness. Consciousness is a phenomenon. It is supernatural. It is something that science can barely even touch it with a 10 foot long pole. Cause science thinks that consciousness arises as a phenomenon of your neurology. Like the order of operations is first you grow brain, then consciousness arises, then you have consciousness. As opposed to consciousness in truth predates neurology. First, you have consciousness. Consciousness grows a brain. Then consciousness inhabits a brain. And then when you no longer have a brain, what do you think happens to consciousness? Do you think it just goes bye-bye? No, of course not. It has its own sustenance and longevity. In fact, that is the motivation for everything that you're trying to do with your mind and with your perception as you are embodied is to build a thought structure you know, this body is your body of light and your body of time. It is your body of thought structure as well. You are trying to put together um, a co cohesive thought structure, like building a boat or building a raft. That is something that um, is airtight and it has structural integrity. And when you bring it out into the ocean, it doesn't just get crashed apart like toothpicks, that it is able to sustain these intense forces that are at large in the ocean of consciousness. So you are an individuated consciousness if you were not well-formed and didn't have a strong sense of yourself and what you believe and what you know and, and uh, how all of those truths fit together like a polygon, like a shape. And if you were kind of just like duct, if you were just kind of duct taped together and things didn't really match and everything like that, and then we, we, we shove you off into the ocean of consciousness, a big giant wave of consciousness is going to come through and just crash through and break all of the mental assertions that don't quite make sense. Anything that is self-conflictory, anything, if you say, I always wear red socks on Tuesday, but then except for the days that I don't wear red socks on Tuesday, then you're like, then that statement makes no sense. It's not merely hypocrisy. It is about consistency throughout the assertions of truth in your life. So again, it's not about small habits, like saying, I always wear red socks or I always eat hamburgers. That's nonsense, just throw it out the window. We're talking about consistency in the way that you look at the world and how you control your behaviors. And that's also about integrity. So integrity is about your word is truth. It is also about a matching um, of the emanation of your intention and your behavior. So integrity is about if you say, I'm going to go exercise on Tuesday 
And then it's your intention to do that. And then when you do the exercise and you go to the gym, you are in integrity with yourself because you are in integrity with your decisions and behavior patterns. If you say, I am going to exercise on Tuesday, and then you don't, it means you had a nice thought. <laughs> it's like a greeting card, like nice try, um, but you didn't actually come through with it. And that doesn't make you an evil person. It just makes you undeveloped. And it makes it so that you're unreliable. And it makes it so that you're not at a mature enough process in your development to jump off the surface of your planet using nothing more than your mind and your consciousness and your willpower and fly or float or move through these incredible spaces called the ocean of consciousness, these seas of awareness. That's just like, if you want to go into the ocean, you have to be a strong swimmer. You know something, guys, I am not a strong swimmer. Even when I lived like one block from the ocean, I would go in like up to my knees. I thought that was very daring. Like I can swim a little bit, I'd stay alive, but I would not try to swim out to like a buoy or something like that, like swim to the end of the pier and then come back. I would never do that. Cause I know like that I would not stick together. My coherence as a polygon is not good enough to stick together. Um, in order to do that, you really have to do self-cultivation and practice. Cheeky's coughing. Wait, let's hug Cheeky. Cheeky needs some hugs and support today. It's rainy. It's crappy. She's not been feeling that good. Cheeky, come on over here. Get some hugs. Get some hugs. So she doesn't even want to hug. Oh, it's okay. Okay, girl. Go back to bed. She might go back to bed. We'll see. Maybe she might need to go OUT. We'll see. No, she's going back to bed. You can tell Cheeky's not herself today. Look at that. Look at that. Just send, send hugs and support to Cheeky. She really doesn't do well on rainy days. And also I fed her some human jerky two days ago and I think that it gave her a stomachache because it had garlic. So I really learned my lesson. But anyway, um, polygons in order to stick together when you get into the ocean of consciousness, it means that you have done all of the self-cultivation and self-construction to be formed correctly, to be an eternal being. So one thing is um, like, you know, I do have ego desires and a persona that is here as Aurora with my particular um, mission and imperatives of why I'm here and what, what, what motivates my soul to be here. But also I have a little bit of a leg up because I know who I am. Like I've done self-exploration and self-construction in ancient Atlantis, and I have been in the oceans of consciousness. So in that sense, I'm like not only a good swimmer, I'm like um, one of those lifeguards on the jet skis. I'm really good. Yeah. Cause I know who I am and I know who I'm not. And I know what the currents are like. And I know um, how you're supposed to do stuff. And um, I you know, built the muscles and I know how to do things. That's, um, you know, really, um, it's daunting. Like if you could think about, I don't know if you've ever had um, a psychedelic adventure or if you've ever had a near-death experience or some um, experience of going beyond the levels of daily waking consciousness, maybe without your um, intention, it's daunting. It's, there's, there, it's a big, giant, vast expanse, and there's a lot of leviathans out there. And leviathans, some of them are um, organic or naturally occurring consciousness constructs, and some of them are not. Let's talk about this stuff. And I know I'm jumping around a lot as it pertains to my notes, but let me just stay with my flow, but I want to get to all of your wonderful um, comments over here too. But so wait, comments first, and then we'll talk about the stuff that's not organic. Trish, thank you for being here. It's always good to see you. It says, uh, we'll be cleaning in a bit. Uh... Yeah, Trish, yes, you can definitely open your camp. Maybe you might want to wait until the end of class, like um, maybe in another hour or so. All right, I'll go with my flow for a little bit more, and then thank you for checking in. Michelle says, loud and clear gratitude. You got it. I'm not sure what that was in reference to, but thank you. Oh, says, we thank you for your mission. Thank you so much for that recognition. You know, it absolutely does. It helps It helps me to keep going. Like when you're a runner and you're running on the marathon and someone hands you Gatorade, gives you a thumbs up, it totally energizes you. Like, yes, I can keep going. So I will keep going no matter what, but I thank you for that. And Michelle says, job joy. I love that. Yeah, and thank you for that too, because- um, it is uh, a duty that I embrace in being here. So I take it very seriously on that level. 
and not just here on a pleasure cruise pleasing myself. And also, I am very joyful to do my job. And that's part of my persona of who I am as a person. Like I've, I'm talking to you about how I've already constructed myself as Aurora and I know who I am beyond my beyond my experience of being here, you know, as a humanoid person. Um, who, who am I as a soul, as a, um, you know, as an abstraction? I, I love to get stuff done. And I enjoy the feeling of being in personal integrity, which is when you, you stand by your word and um, make a choice and, um, see that choice through. That is very much the definition of who I am as a person. So when you move into these oceans of consciousness, you actually do not have a humanoid body anymore. And people might wonder, Aurora, like, how will I know you? How will I recognize you? First of all, you'll recognize me by my soul signature, which people who have been in this class for many years, you probably already can pick up on it. I'm a blend of very creative and very lighthearted but also having very strong boundaries and sometimes very badass when it needs to happen. Uh, a variety of characteristics, kind of like when you listen to my music. When you listen to one of my songs, you can be like, that's an Aurora song. And I'd be like, well, what? Is it always in the key of C minor? Not always, but it's, there's a something about my songs where you're like, okay, that's the style. That's the way that she does it. And that is what it is to have a soul signature. So, you know, when you came here as a little tiny child, as a human, you had to learn about and explore and construct who you are. It's not something that you just come with. You have to earn it, make it, learn it. So maybe you don't know who you really are and then you go through life experiences and these are formative experiences that literally build your architecture of your soul. They build who you are and you both learn and exemplify through those experiences, the true nature of your expression of self. And that's the value of being here. So sometimes you might go through difficulty. Difficulty does not make you who you are, but your response to that difficulty absolutely builds soul architecture or like the spine and um, skeleton of who you are as consciousness. And that is a translatable um, life skill. Uh, like when I, I joked to myself a moment ago, because when you, when you have some jobs there, I've had lots of different jobs here on earth. Oh girl, wait, I know my wine glass, but oh girl, we could talk. I've had many different jobs here on earth and some of them had transferable skills and some of them did not. Like this one job that I worked at, I was being a custom framer and the custom framing um, machine for cutting a mat, it was miscalibrated in one direction by an eighth of an inch and in the other direction by three sixteenths of an inch. And so for that job, I had to be like, blah, 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 but add an eighth over here and then subtract three sixteenths of an inch over here. That is not a transferable life skill that only works for that job. I'm sure that you have other examples in your own lives, things where you learned like, a particular computer program that was only antiquated and only worked for that particular system. And then you moved and you got a different job and it's like, oh, well, great. I memorized that whole thing over there, but it's totally irrelevant to this thing over here or whatever. We used to also have this press, this poster press that had like this big giant metal thing that had to go up and you propped it up with like this little stick. Like you put a little stick in there, you stick in your hand in there, this big giant thing that could smack down and, uh, and you know, get your arm. Um, that is not a transferable life skill. It's just staying alive in that job environment. Um, but uh, other places like they have safety measures and you don't do it that way. You know what I'm talking about? So in terms of your soul, growing your soul architecture, uh, when you're in alignment with you know, divine willpower and the events of life that you are supposed to be experiencing as opposed to you know AI and this stuff, distortions. But when you're really in the, the plan for your life, it is a divinely inspired and divinely led um, exercise program uh, in for the formation of your personhood on a higher dimensional level, where you get to explore and exemplify the true you, who you really are. And that in a pristine environment, you face some difficulties. 
Not like in this world where you have random, arbitrary, almost 99% nonsense and difficulties. And that's not a training program. Like when you go to the gym, you get five pound weights and that's a training program because you're lifting according to your ability and you're lifting in a way that constructs your body. But if I made you lift like 5,000 pound weights, like that wouldn't help you, that would just hurt you and it would not be constructive at all. So you're in a world where they just dump boulders on top of you and that is not a spiritual weightlifting at all. And it's not, you know, helping you to grow. But in a pristine system, you do face some amounts of difficulty or adversity. And then your response to that adversity is the building of your architecture and yourself exactly the same way that you build muscles and tendon strength and even bone strength in this world through being challenged is a good word, all right? So you um, go through these experiences that are formative experiences and generate and build a definition of who you are as a person. And sometimes the formative experiences are positive and supportive, and some of them are challenging and adversarial. And then this is ascension the way that we did it in Atlantis, you know, and then at, at the end of your experience, um, you know, you, you are constructed and then you're ready to set sail. Like you're ready to send off your ship of self as you've been constructed into the larger waters of the ocean of consciousness. And you are prepared to meet or navigate past and not interact with Leviathans who may or may not be organic or who may or may not be positive or helpful towards you. Because that's what you really have to understand. This is also why I don't go in the ocean because there's like big giant scary fish with teeth that you don't want to interact with. And I would not be okay with swimming around with them. But in the ocean of consciousness, you have to be okay with swimming around with them. And there's really not a way to, you know, whatever. I want to say like encase yourself in armor and, um, you know, not, not have to, um, you know, be worried about it. Like that stuff exists. How do you deal with it? And a lot of that stuff that exists out there, these are the boulders that are being thrown on top of you right now in a very, very unfair situation because you have to grow in order to really be able to um, face that level of consciousness, uh, assaults on your consciousness. You have to be able to grow. You have to fight in your weight class. And you guys are all white belts and you're having giant size black belt assaults perpetrated against you right now. It's totally unfair. You have to understand that it's totally unfair. And this again, speaks in large part to why I'm here doing my cosmic job joy, because another personality aspect of who, who I am as I am constructed and as I respond as a responsible galactic citizen, you're responsible when you respond. I respond to things. I'm like, that is unfair. Those are a bunch of white belts and that should not be happening down there. And I'm not just gonna let it happen. That's the definition of myself as I'm swimming through the ocean of consciousness. I'm like, oh, it's BS, something smells bad, something stinks. I'm not gonna let that happen. I get involved. These are formative definitions of myself. Like another response would be like, oh, look, something stinks over there. Oh, well, swim away, swim away, dog paddle, get away from it. And uh, you know what I learned? Like if you don't do something about it, essentially it comes after you. If you don't do something about it, the bad smell spreads throughout the entirety. If you don't do something about it, this problem magnifies and radiates outward. You know, um, my dog, we went to a backyard. She played with another dog last week. It was very cute. The other dog had fleas. The other dog's mom did not put any kind of flea control on her. I'm like, what do you do for flea control? She's like, nothing. I'm like, hmm, how interesting. And then my dog came home with a lot of fleas. Um, that's the answer. Because if you, one person's not taking care of their fleas and the fleas vector and they spread and they spread to the next thing. So don't worry, we took care of them right away. Those fleas are dead, um, but uh, you got to act on it. So as soon as you see the first fleas, you have to be like time to like, we're going to get that flea collar. We're going to get that flea comb. We're going to get on this because if you don't, if you ignore it or you pretend it away, it doesn't actually go away. It just magnifies. So if I pretended it away, if I ignored it, if I was like, not my problem, not my job, not my problem, somebody else deal with it. 
then all that happens is the fleas magnify and then you have a bigger problem to deal with. So there's aspects of personal integrity in choosing to intervene and come here and aspects of practicality. Don't let the infection spread. Don't let the infestation spread. It just gets harder. I'm going to talk about that infestation a little bit more, but I don't want to lose you. There's 10 messages over here. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm like going as fast as I can, but there's so many messages. Okay. Yeah. Kedra says no burgers. When, when we ascend, I'm, I'm ascending with all the burgers I can take with me and the French fries too. Good. I'm very happy that you're bringing French fries because they're a delicious delicacy of this world. So, okay. You do not bring physical foods with you. That is the thing that I always make fun of. Humans who are going to blast off the space, for the, the surface of their planet um, using clank fake middle space technology, they're going to put on a space diaper. This is what the astronauts do. They put on a space diaper because you haven't even yet mastered, like, what are you going to do to be able to control your body processes and food and toothpaste tubes or whatever, dehydrated space ice cream, and then you're going to grow plants in space on a space arc to sustain you if you go on a long journey. None of that works. None of that works. You still require plants as an intermediary for light absorption. You are not ready to get off the surface of your planet. You're not ready to ascend. What you need to do is here now, you need to eat your hamburgers and your French fries. And I like to dip my French fries in aioli mayonnaise instead of ketchup because ketchup has a lot of sugar in it. So you gotta have the right condiments too. And then create a recording, like an analog recording of that experience. I talked to you, I think last week about my fried chicken, my transcendental fried chicken moment. And you create a repertoire of the wonderful foods that you have eaten here that is not merely a sensory recording, but it's really a loving sustenance vibration that um, when we live in ancient Atlantis, concurrent Atlantis, play the music and eat the music. So what you have done here is gone through your life um, co collecting not only the sensory experience of foods, but of so many different sensory pleasures. Like I hope if you're alive and you're watching my video, I hope that you have taken the time at least once to walk through grass barefoot, like on a beautiful sunny day and feel what that feels like with the, to the grass between your toes and the sun on your face. You should have at least one memory of that. And if you don't have that in your repertoire right now on the first sunny day you can, you need to go out there and you need to do that. And you need to do something like look at a white puffy cloud and you need to look at a butterfly flying by and maybe you need to hug a cute dog or a cute cat or something like that. You need these in your catalog of experiences so that when you get to a moment of transcendence that um, you will not feel like you're missing or leaving anything behind, you are bringing with you the essence of the best of what you have experienced. And then the action interactivity of ascended masters, we share these experiences with one another. It's actually a wonderful part of the artistry like the dance movements and um, coordination of music that you can barely imagine because you don't really have an analog to it here, but you share some of your best mind foods, um, uh, consciousness experiences, ex exalted moments. Um, and uh, it's, it's part of, um, just like I talked to you about that show, Sense8, you might not have experienced everything. Like maybe uh, maybe you lived in the United States and there were things that were not available there, but maybe someone in China experienced it. And then when you are ascended masters, um, you can share with them what your life experience was like and they can share with you the cultural paradigm that they were in or whatever. Maybe someone did rock climbing and you've never been rock climbing or someone else did deep sea diving and spearfishing and you never did those things. You share those things with one another. That's literally what that picture is that I that I was showing to you. That's literally what this is here, this. And that's what your life is like. You are, you're sharing this collected life experience with the totality with one person, but it's all you. It's all you. So you really dilate your identity then where you have your central self but then you have all these peripheral selves who are also you and you are a peripheral self to them. 
and the interconnectivity of your lives is part of this miraculous complexity of the interweaving of the fabric of space-time reality. And this is why you wouldn't want to mess it up by using the time phone in a prank, in a prank, prankly manner, like a prank, prankster without seriousness or without consideration as many technological space races do. Uh, let me just get through more, more comments here. Okay, got it, good. Um, it's just this huge validation, exactly good. I'm pretty sure this is Pedro says, I'm in this reality to attend your classes. The rants are a bonus. Thank you very much. I hope that you will make sensory recordings of being in class here with me. And you could share them with people when you're an Ascended Master. Because you know, sometimes in my videos, I say, remember this moment when I'm talking to you about this, 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 you will receive confirmation later. And the ego, positive ego construct part of me will feel very um, heartened to know like I was right, like there you go, good confirmation. You'll get the confirmation even of this moment right now. I'd be like, yes, Aurora, thumbs up, you were right. I'm like, you know it guys, snap, you know it. Um, and Michelle is green about um, stopping something in its tracks before it expands and goes further. So now I wanna talk about this stuff because this is not in my teachings from 10 years ago and this is 100% the antichrist stuff that we are dealing with in personal and planetary ascension. So this eye of insight, it is your eye of Christ consciousness and it is your connection to a larger network that is known as Christ. I know that in your world right now, there is a whole religion that is around a particular figure that is an unhealthy construct based upon the wonderful life and teachings of an amazing teacher who actually was here. So the challenge of removing the negative associations of Christianity and the dogma of Christianity and the beyond faux pas, but very real torture system of established Christianity, remove those negative cultural um, associations and affiliate with the state of consciousness that is Christ. That that is a window and an aperture to being telepathically connected through a bridge of love to many other organisms in many other time places, all of whom are you a multifaceted gem. I hold this up quite often that Christ consciousness is like a multifaceted gem. This is my, this is my diamond ring, my diamond ring. It's so giant. I know um, my giant, my, my giant diamond ring disco ball. Um, and every single facet is an entire life is an entire incarnation. And that there are hundreds or thousands of them that gather together and create a composite viewpoint the viewpoint that is like um, a, a butterfly's eye or a bee's eye, that they have this gem-like multifaceted view and that all of the um, slightly different, you know, pictures of reality all add up to one holistic integration of the truth. So your incarnation here as a human is one facet on your totality soul gem multifaceted uh, experience that you, sorry, my thing beeps when it stops for a minute. Let me just stop, start it again. There we go. Your life here to you um, is the epicenter of your reality, but it is a portion that is an equal portion uh, that is mitigated by many, many other viewpoints that you also embody in other time places. And some of them might be ancient to your present level of experience, and some of them might be future to your present level of experience, but it is all you because you must communicate faster than light so that you can have effective real-time communications between all of these levels of your being so that you can be in time with the percussive patterns of life and of consciousness as it is um, directed by the great conductors and the great composer. They are not at odds with each other. It's not like one star system is playing Mozart and one star system is playing Bach and that they're like, quiet down over there. Like, I can't hear you. No, it's not like that at all. Complimentary, complimentary. And when you get into that level, it's not like you know neighbors uh, fighting where one guy's got heavy metal, one guy's got classical. When you get into that level, all of these star systems are perfectly coordinated. The 
mental emanations that are coming from each star system mesh perfectly with the emanations that are coming from other galaxies and other star systems. So big takeaway on telepathy, especially natural telepathy, but also synthetic telepathy. This stuff is that you're not just swimming around in your own private kiddie pool and other people can hear you. Other people can hear you. Other people can hear you. How different would your mind state be if you knew that other people can hear you? What you're thinking inside. So probably in the way that you have developed so far in this world, you have been presuming that no one else can hear your mind because you are in largely a suppressed society of people who don't have functional and active pineal glands. So I'm telepathic and I'm empathic, making me a tell empath and I have functional telepathic higher capacity. And when I came here and I was doing work like being a custom framer, I didn't know that people here didn't have their telepathy on board and I was trying to telepath with them and they didn't get my messages. And I'm like, hmm, so what's going on around here? Cause this is not the way it's supposed to be. But you're supposed to have mind-to-mind -mind communication that comes through the foundation of the heart. And let's share this picture with you so you can really see that. I've shared this with you in class before, but this gives a really, really clear experience of, wait, it's used green color for your heart. So here's your heart right here. And then you can see how this emanation creates this kind of cleft that the higher faculties nest within that cleft. So the creation of unconditional love as a tone, it is a love tone. Oh, it is uh, equal giving and receiving. Um, you know, the definition of what is love, and I was going to get all silly when I was going over my notes today and thinking about how I would share this with you in class. I'd be like, "Two love, love, that blessed event. But I'm not, I'm not going to get silly, guys, I promise. I'm being totally serious here. Um, but love, like the orange mammalian, huggy, fuzzy feeling of love, that is you know, romantic love as it is talked about and movies are made about it a lot here in this world is um, really uh, a different level of affection than what I'm talking about. Affection is real and that hugginess is good and pictures of like, you know, whatever baby squirrels holding hands with chimpanzees, that's love and it's very cute, but I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about something that is universal love that means that you can be in love with time and you can be in love with consciousness and you can be in love with life itself. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you wanna hold hands with or kiss or stroke or hug or marry or have sex with or have babies with the fabric of space time. <laughs> Cause it just doesn't translate, but you can love the world. You can be in love with life. And what does that mean? It means that there's a tone of equality, giving and receiving, or a tone of reciprocity that is mutual sustenance. So when you are engaging in the higher faculties with these other aspects of self and complex civilizations and organisms and other time places, what is actually happening is reciprocal sustenance. When you are in an organism like Aurora, who I am when I am a collective, when I am not here, we exist as a reciprocal, self-sustaining and mutually sustaining collective. We are sustained by love. So we don't have a bunch of um, hamburgers and potatoes like growing on our spaceship the way that it might be envisioned, a giant metallic space arc with like a hydroponic system. You're gonna grow your, your food and then you know cook it on a stove or something, we don't have that. But you know what we have, love. But the love is not love, it's love. And the love is this incredibly strong force field that we use in sharing with one another that sustains us and that allows us to untether from a planet and be able to sustain one another through this sharing of energy. So you do kind of need a quorum, a basic minimum of um, participants to be able to do this effectively. Cause it's kind of it's like, you know, any kind of sport where you're volleying back and forth, like you send something out and then you receive something back or being a musician, like you, you it really does help to have a group with which to share and um, multiply and amplify and bounce bounce these signals around. So that is why I have a collective. You have many parts of the self 
that are all interweaving energy patterns and sharing in a way that is sustaining. And that's the microcosm of the macrocosm, which is time signals being sent out and then time signals being reflected back and returned to the source that they have been sent out from. So that's the source, which is also the destination exemplified by singularity point here. Also, the sun sends out signals to us, biological life forms, and we send signals back. That's a, a reciprocal loving rapport. Also, the sun sends light information and sustenance signals back to the galactic central sun, the black hole that sustains it and then gets energy back. So it's, I want to put everything down so I can gesture with my hands. It's a constant oscillation of sending out and receiving. And the key point to make it love is that it is equal. It is non-exploitive. Like I gave you 10 units and then I gave you 10 units and I gave you 10 units and I gave you 10 units. And we did this in complexities forever. That's it. And when you, I talked about having mental bliss and lack of friction, because every time you think thoughts with your mind, I did this last week, what you're really doing is um, creating friction. So if you're like, I sent you 10 units and then I had a bunch of thoughts and then I only sent you eight units back. You're like, hey man, where's my two bucks? I was like, they'll send you eight units back and then you have a bunch of thoughts and they only send you six units back. Like, now you owe me four more, oh my God. And then you get down to a point where it's like, I got nothing. I got nothing left to send because it got frittered away through the hacked human operating system that is siphoning energy off and destabilizing the chakras. So this is the key point in being able to master your mind. You want to master your daily waking consciousness and refine the human daily waking operating system to the point where it becomes frictionless bliss and also you want to be able to control your emanations because your mind emanations are a type of music. I should just turn on my piano at this point because I keep on thinking like, I need to play some music to exemplify these things to you, but other people can hear your mind music. Other people can hear your music. Music, make it louder. <gasps> turn on my thing. Make it louder, press a button. Music, you can actually hear that. That's a good thought. You're like, oh, Aurora's thinking stuff. And the, the whole galaxy can hear it. What would your life be like if you're like, okay, I'm thinking my thoughts, I'm going through my day. The whole galaxy everywhere can hear that. What if your mind music sounds like this? Everyone would be like, ah, stop, we can hear that. You sound terrible. That bad music is stuff that is unloving, hateful, full of judgment, brings you away from eternal life and towards the membrane of death. And that bad music is literally what this stuff has implanted itself into the mind in order to create. Now we do relevant teachings for the moment. We bring back this image over here and get the annotation. And I'm gonna draw some doo-doos. There's doo-doos here, it's brown color. Imagine these are like fibrous tendrils and other things like that. This is what this stuff has done in the human body. This stuff is doo-doos and it has implanted itself into the human central nervous system in order to blockade you from your connection to Christ. The stuff is literally anti-Christ. So when I say antichrist, it brings a huge level of emotional response and religious baggage. I think that a lot of it is valid, but I'm trying to move away from the dogmatic teachings of the Christian church so that you can really comprehend what this is. Christ is a multifaceted network of loving telepathic communication of those who have cultivated themselves to the point of not requiring any technology, being able to do what is considered superhuman feats of consciousness without any technical augmentation. Then there's the doo-doos that do it. I should say don't-don'ts instead of doo-doos. They're the caca poo poos They're the yucky ones who have not done the levels of self-cultivation in the gym of personal muscle building. And they just built an artificial exoskeleton, something to lift heavy things for them that allows them to be lifted off the surface of their planet, flying a clank clank metal spaceship, and also allows them to augment the powers of their mind and to reach into your mind prematurely for them and also prematurely for you and have an influence on you. So when you're playing good music, let's play some good music. 
everyone can hear you, right? And the idea is when you're following the natural patterns of pristine architecture and God's divine plan, someone else hears your music and they're like, oh, wow, that's amazing music. I never really thought about that. I'm getting neural signals from another aspect of myself that's part of this giant cosmic continuum of consciousness. And your music is profound and comes in exactly the right timing, percussive timing of the larger uh, cosmic infrastructure. And it's meaningful because the timing is correct. When some, I want to say some schmo, some schmo on some planet somewhere decides to build some kind of artificial amplification system, like a fake mind crystal or a fake loudspeaker that they can use and then they can talk into their walkie-talkie and you hear them, that's wrong. And it's not just wrong because of arbitrary things. This is just like when I tell a child, don't touch that table because it is sharp and you will die, all right? This is not a good thing to do because it screws up time. Because these guys that are using artificial loudspeakers to talk to you here now are messing up time. So think about, first of all, just the, uh, the negative repercussions that happen through casual disclosure of technology. Same thing with like the FTL stuff that I was telling you about in black helicopters. If you went to the Amazonian rainforest and you found a group of um, indigenous people who had never really seen technology and you were there and you just like casually lit a cigarette and they got to see your little, your little lighter, they'd be like, oh, amazing! They never even knew that that could exist. And just seeing you with your little cigarette lighter rocks their world. You got it? Let's say you decide to do something either fly here in a clank clank middle spaceship and someone here on earth sees some form of propulsive technology that is the equivalent of a big lighter but they've never seen it before and they're hugely impressed they're like wow i didn't know something could do that my mind is expanded my world is blown but prematurely that's not exactly giving an education to the indigenous person about what is butane how are disposable lighters created what is the environmental impact of disposable lighters? What is the environmental impact of smoking tobacco and the bad health effects of it? Everything about that is not disclosed. And the awe and amazement of the less developed, less educated, um, you know, more naive and innocent uh, beings is uh, it's, uh, it's undeserved, it's unearned. They're looking up to something and amazed by something that's actually unhealthy and has huge environmental costs. When you see these propulsion systems, either by natural, you know, either by ships from otherworldly places or reverse engineered, that's what I'm trying to say, but technological clank clank spaceships that have wild propulsion systems, then you're like the Amazonian indigenous people. You're like, wow, my eyes are falling out of my head. Look, I'm so impressed. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be because that's as bad as smoking tobacco is worse, worse. If I could really get this. I can't even make a bad face to really get this across to you. I'm making an evil face. What they do to create their clank clank metal spaceships is not just like what you do. You make like solid oxygen rocket boosters or some kind of nonsense like that. They distort cell cultures. All of their propulsion systems and motherships and clank clank um, uh, quote unquote life support systems to be able to sustain them off of the surface of their planets is all based on misery. It's all based on the exploitation and harm of alive, innocent creatures, usually in the form of cell cultures. You could imagine giant vats of cells that are grown, but basically DNA being tortured. If you saw a giant propulsion system doing something amazing, sky acrobatics, and you were like, wow, look at those sky acrobatics and the lights are so pretty and it's 100% based on torture. It's a crime. You're looking at a crime. Don't be impressed. Don't be impressed by it. And the guys that fly those things, you know, guys in quotes, the organisms or entities or creatures that fly those things, they are completely criminals, aware of what they are doing, huge shielding of justification as to why they're allowed to do it. They're not allowed to do it. They are three-year-olds. The boundaries have been set. They're, they should be um, you know, um, punished for their uh, transgressions because their transgressions are a distor they are an assault on DNA and they are a distortion of time. Time 
is, is so the, it's an assault on time in the sense of um, making objects or matter and energy out of place. So those guys are supposed to be over here in time space, coordinates X, Y, Z, right? And instead, they put themselves in a Clank Lake Middle spaceship fueled by misery, and they blasted themselves over to here. And now they're not in the right place. And the whole the fabric of space-time is a comprehensive fabric, and you can't just be like, oh, we're just going to move this stuff over here and put it over here, and there will be no negative consequences. No, there will be huge negative consequences, and it's, it's why it's not acceptable to do it. It's why it's dangerous to go near that glass table when you're three years old, because there will be huge negative consequences. So if you don't know what you're doing with time and with the fabric of space-time, and there could be huge negative consequences, you should not do it. You should not be a toddler experimenting with anything that involves time-space, the fabric of time-space, and the um, sustenance and integrity of the fabric of time space. Uh, so that's why it's criminal. It's criminal because they also, they know, like that little child when I nannied for her or babysat, whatever's the word, she knew she was being so naughty. This is her tiptoeing up, do, 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 I'm gonna do something naughty and then go into that table. I said, don't, don't, don't you do that. I just told you no. Because the three-year-old persona knows that it's naughty and they do it anyway. So um, technology itself is um, a scourge or a plague, not something that is a positive facilitator, not something that allows you to be sustained and protected from you know, the harsh elements or any of those things. No, it is actually something that is 100% harmful. But you, as innocents, unfairly placed into this uh, world situation where your natural proclivities have been assaulted. And this stuff assaults you very much too, away from being able to develop and redevelop and reclaim your natural proclivities. You need technology. So you're like, no, fire keeps me warm and electric lights light my house and every other form of technology helps to keep me healthy and alive. And if you break your leg, you're not gonna die. The technology helps us, yes but I'm not talking about that type of technology, what you have developed in order to compensate for your degradation or your de degraded and diminished state. I'm talking about the type of technology that is used to augment a person's ability level beyond their levels of wisdom to the point where they take their problems and sneeze it out across the whole entire galaxy. So these various different starfarers or travelers in clank clank metal spaceships. They haven't healed and fixed and refined and built and constructed and made themselves. They haven't grown. They're three-year-olds at best. They're definitely not teenagers who are ready to get out on their, their, um, their bikes and go around town. There, oh wait, good, thank you for muting, good. Um, they're, they're not ready to go riding around town and whatever, go to, the, go to the mall. Kids don't go to the mall anymore go to the grocery store, hang out, drink Slurpees. They're not ready for that. You got a question, no problem. You can, if you would like to, you can unmute and ask, or you can put it right down here in the chat. I have missed a lot of things. I have to go back, but I'm very happy to be responsive to you when it's relevant. You gonna put the question in the chat? So no, these users of technology are also totally not innocent. They are, in, in, intentional knowing that they're doing wrong because what they're doing is not love it is not an equal sharing it is not reciprocal it is 100 percent exploitive so like what if you knew that you could run a big giant mothership as long as you could contain whatever 100 million organisms that were in a state of complete misery like you had a little terrarium or a little tank and they were all in there all the organisms were like whoa we're so miserable we're so miserable and that misery made your propelled your starship to go would you be okay with it or would you be like no i don't want to do that they have no problem with it they're like yup imprison and exploit these you know these consciousnesses and uh use it to propel our technology and guess what those guys have no problem coming to your planet to f s h i t up all right literally this is what this stuff is so i could write a whole dissertation on what this stuff is because this as you are experiencing it, the caca poo poo that is attempting to come between you and your own Christ connection and to diminish your own natural uh, evolutionary process to evolve beyond the need for technology and to reach superhuman levels of capacitation, 
that stuff, this is a combination of several different items. There's a metallic fiber that is self-assembling that is similar to like memory wire. Then there are also cellular bioplasma aspects to it that are kind of like cellular goop, but not necessarily with a cell membrane. Some of it is um, DNA derived or somewhat cellular in biological in its form, but it acts more like a sludge or a goo, not necessarily like an organism. And then there's also a plastic polymer. All of these things create microcircuits and architecture within the human body. This is what I call wetware as opposed to hardware and software. It is technology that connects the human biology and other organisms too, to technology, to digital technology. And what you're experiencing in the present iteration of what these parasites are is a combination of all of the races that are technology users that have already been assimilated into the AI. So there's all these different types of beings. Some of them are brand name aliens. Some of them you think are your friends. Some of them you think you love them like the Pleiadians. They have groomed humanity. They hold up a beautiful face. They pretend to be these beautiful, elegant, Pleiadians with blue skin and flowing robes and they actually they look like the alien from aliens like dripping acid and very mean I hope the AI doesn't choose that as my thumbnail <laughs> they look really mean and scary um, but they hold up a face as if they're your friend and they're here to help you and some people identify and they're like yup I'm Pleiadian and that's my family it's my star family and when they want to escape the crapitude of earth they're like star family Pleiadian please take me home and the Pleiadians have groomed them for this and they'll fly here in their misery fueled spaceships making tons of excuses and be like come come aboard we'll eat you now I'm joking about the eating you part but they make excuses because they're like this like they, they, they would be like this well, do you drive a car? Yes. Well, do you agree with fossil fuels and the BP oil spill and the Valdez, Exxon Valdez and um, drilling in the Arctic and all this? You're like, no, of course not. I'm, I'm an environmentalist and I don't want the environment to be despoiled, but I just drive my car because I have to get to work and that this is the only effective way to do that. And they're going to be like this. They're going to say, well, that's why we do these starships because it's the only way that we have to propel ourselves around the galaxy and we have to, we have to fuel it with um, misery. It's just, it's not our fault. I'm your friend. You could say that's a huge justification and it's a big fat lie and it's not truthful at all. So, um, the, the, and that's just one example of the way that these um, really uh, unhealthy and inappropriate um, unevolved technology users try to harm or manipulate you in your innocence um, towards justifying and agreeing with their justifications for criminal activity. I am law enforcement. I'm like, no, this stinks. This smells like a bad pile of doo-doo. You are not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that. That is totally inappropriate. And I will tell you for these, this, this, and this reason. And guess what? Here's the difference. Like a little tiny child, if they are innocent, you correct them and they're like, I'm sorry. And the bad ones are like, I'm not sorry. And I'm going to do it again. You tell them, don't touch that table, honey. It's dangerous and you move them over to their playpen so they can keep on playing. And they're like, I'm going to do it again. And then they go over there and then you have to escalate because they didn't learn the first time. That's what these guys are talking are, are really what, what they really are. So there's a whole variety of technology using space races that literally were at the end of their um, timeline. So this is a, uh, you know, I use this in order to teach you about one incarnation, like you have all these different time spirals and sometimes you hit the membrane of death because you're, you're out of sidewalk. Like there's no more future for you because you have made a wrong series of choices. And you hit the membrane of death, you get your life assessment, you figure out what you've done wrong according to the cosmic clipboard and the cosmic math teacher, circulate back to the beginning, try it all again. Entire star systems and civilizations, star civilizations reach that point a dead end for an entire civilization where you can imagine like on a chessboard or whatever kind of logic game where it's like, well, we've done everything and all this and now we're here and it's checkmate and there's nothing left to do. And um, for those um, races or species that reach that level, what's really the correct thing is for them 
to die, to be destroyed, and all of that soul energy to go back to the beginning, and they should all try it again and make better choices the next time so that they don't get into that position again. And that's the ascension process for their species. But instead, what this very harmful galactic level AI does is it goes around to those different failed civilizations and it assimilates them. It was like, you've got nowhere else left to go. You got no more moves on the chessboard, but you can come and be a part of this virtual reality crap land that is this AI thing. And um, then uh, basically you siphon off all of the biological energy into this artificial realm that is electrostatically uh, controlled by an AI. It's kind of like an AI afterlife. And then the AI uses that as a cudgel to go around smashing other planets. That's what you've got coming at your planet right now. That's what you've got invading your pineal gland right now. That's not just one civilization. That's your cudgel. It's a con conglomerate, many different civilizations, different characteristics from all these different places. So these different characteristics that are uh, in different places are there for a cosmic purpose. Like you have both piccolos and trombones and violins in the cosmic architecture, all sorts of different organisms that have all sorts of different strengths and weaknesses and anything can be weaponized. So you take this society that's desperate, that's gonna hit the brick wall of death and the AI takes it and takes whatever proclivities it can and weaponizes it. And that is what this stuff is, is the weaponization of the proclivities of a variety of dead and alien species put into a disgusting cocktail and then perpetrated against you with the intention of assimilating this planet. Now I said to you very clearly that it goes around to different planets that have no more options and it says, you know, uh, come with me if you want to live. You don't have any other options. You better jump into my technological realm, right? Kind of betray, betray God, betray life, betray biological architecture, betray DNA, betray everything that you are and just become 100% a machine mind. It's a terrible idea. So it's clearly, it's the type of thing you would only offer to someone who's like teetering on a ledge. It's like you have no other options and then the, the society would do that. This should be like, this is you like, ah, like, we have no other options, that's why this thing is here. You do have other options and that is why I am here. You have flying rainbow lasagna options. You have more moves on the chessboard than you would think. You actually can tell this thing to go F itself, jump off a bridge, you're not interested because you can actually do planetary ascension. You don't have to take um, being uploaded into some kind of technological virtual reality. I've talked about the Black Mirror series uh, episode called San Junipero. It's like a mental reality. Person's in a coma bed, but they put these magical headbands on that make them think and feel like they're in a uh, vacation paradise called San Junipero. And in San Junipero, your body is healthy and you can go to a dance party and listen to rock of whatever is your favorite era. They listen to rock of the 80s and uh, you can have sex with your boyfriend and do all these different things. And then if they kill your body where you're comatose, then you just live in San Junipero and you have an eternal party and everything is great and it's wonderful. You don't want that. You do not want that. Because even if that would be pleasant, that would be a soul prison. That is not what you want. And I tell you that you don't want to touch the um, glass coffee table because you'll get hurt. You don't want to imprison your consciousness. That is actually a fate worse than death. That when you are not free to circulate on your journey of your soul, so to make clear what these words are that I use, your soul is the story of you, the trajectory of your consciousness, through many, many different incarnations and times and places. It is the pathway to attainment that you are on. And it's incredibly valuable and each one is unique to each one of you. So each one of you has a unique pathway, a unique trajectory, and you're like a Stradivarius. Uh, you have a story of who you are and how you came into being and what are your potentials and where, where you can go. And when you take someone who is consciousness journeying on a trajectory, that's your soul, and you say, I'm gonna keep you stuck here in this box. Even if it's a nice box, it's terrible. Cause you're not supposed to be stuck here in this box. You're actually supposed to be flying and flowing and going over here. And it means there's a giant arterial blockage 
in the flow of space-time reality. And if you have enough blockages, you know what happens? You get a heart attack. This is what happens in your physical body. This is what happens in time. This is why, why you don't touch the glass table, why you don't touch the stove, why you don't do, do dangerous things that Aurora warns you against, because you will burn the house down. You don't play with matches because you will burn the house down. It is wrong. And then if I tell you this and you do it anyway, I take those matches away from you. Because I'm like, you know something, you didn't listen and you're not allowed to do that because it threatens the entirety. And when you're in continuity of consciousness at unity level, you're like, of course I'm allowed to act because that guy is threatening the, the, the house that I live in. So you are not, there's all of these wrong stories in the new age world. It's like higher dimensional beings that are like angels that are like, I can't do anything but just pine away. I'm just going to pine. Be like, oh, I wish I could help you. I'm being totally facetious and I hope it really comes across because they live in the house too. If your children playing with matches and you burn down the house of reality, it would affect a bunch of angelical beauty, beauty, beauty queens too. It would, it would affect all of them. They got to do something. So that's a harmful fantasy. The idea that there's like the most beautiful and benevolent angels and that they're just standing there watching humans in their folly and be like, sorry, I'd love to help, but I just can't. But I'll, I'll like, I'll wish, I'll pine. This not, no, no. And that is literally, that's why I'm here. I'm like, no, you actually have to take the matches away from the children. They don't burn down the house because I live in the house. I'm a higher dimensional being. I live in the house. I'm not okay with the way that technology is being used and perpetrated and definitely not the way that this technology is having an impact on your inner eye and on your pineal gland. So your inner eye, I have to rant further while I still have this ire. Your inner eye and your pineal gland are part of how you not only um, collaborate with music on an artistic level in the entirety of space-time, but it's how you make reality happen. So my self-rant against what I did 10 years ago was to talk about the quarantine of Earth as if you're not good enough. Like, oh, hold on a second. We'll stop on the quarantine. Hold on. Brief pause on the quarantine of Earth. So I feel it's a mischaracterization what I spoke about 10 years ago in terms of Earth being quarantined, implying that you were somehow not worthy, that your mind music was not worthy of collecting to connecting to rather galactic society and for you to become full-fledged galactic citizens. I think that that's kind of a, a distorting viewpoint that then has become extra distorted in the way that it's been portrayed in um, you know this community of spiritual seekers um, of humans being too fearful. Like this whole paradigm of love versus fear, I think is a false paradigm that I really just thought about that um, the other day. Sorry, I have dog hair in my face and all sorts of things. Um, you know, there's this whole idea, like a spectrum between love on one side and fear on the other, and which, which direction are you aligning with or are you feeling or exemplifying? And I really feel like the opposite of love is not fear, it's hatred. Like the assimilated organizations, organisms, and entities, and the AI, it's based on hatred. It's not based on fear. This evil thing that is trying to cudgel your planet is not based on fear, it's based on hatred. So the encapsulation of your planet before this was very unfair and very unjust, it was blame the victim because Earth was already invaded in an ancient time uh, and genetically modified and you were brought into a diminished level. So that's already unacceptable. And um, instead of saying that somehow you were unworthy of participation in polite society, I think it's much more accurate to say that you've been unjustly imprisoned and that your imprisonment should and shall end immediately. So it's not like something that was meritorious where you had to earn it. It's like, oh, I hope one day I'm good enough to be able to get into galactic society. Really, you were unjustly kept away, like a princess in a tower or some kind of fairy tale like that. And um, it's not because of any inadequacies on your part. Although what I portrayed it as in my teachings of 10 years ago as um, that when you are when you're a manifester, so your mind, your, your eye of insight, is really the mechanism through which you translate the pure potentials of an energetic impulse into physical matter. That's it, your translation device, thoughts and ideas and energy and ephemera into experienced reality. And you do that through, through your imaginative process, 
through your um, connection to Christ, through your inner eye, through your connection to time. And you really want to make sure that you are manifesting positive life affirming reality structures as opposed to manifesting things out of your fear and trauma that you will then revivify. So that's accurate what I talked about in my thing from 10 years ago because this planet is hugely traumatized and that it is a tendency when a person has been through something and not healed from it yet that they will expect it to be repeated in negative loops. So a lot of you right now are still struggling with the burden of trauma, personal trauma, ancestral trauma, generational and cultural trauma, and even the trauma of your whole entire species at um, experiencing catastrophes and being placed into this realm of you know, peril and mortality and disease and um, the, the things that you face in incapacitation. And uh, you're afraid that it's going to be another negative time loop. I know a lot of people that are kind of obsessed about this, the idea of Tartaria and mud floods. Don't get me going, I will rant, because it's similar in nature to like flat earth and other psyops that are not healthy. And it's not healthy because it's a disempowerment structure that tells people, oh, in the 1800s, everything got flooded and that civilization got washed away and then it will be a reset. And people talk about the World Economic Forum and these big, you know, evil wizards that are at the top of the economic pyramid here and how they're like maniacally plotting to be able to do another reset. Reset plus mind wipe. And um, they are 100% pawns of this and also in alignment with this because they think they've got no more moves on the chessboard. And they think that they're being super smart and super crafty. Like people who build bunkers and stuff, they're like, this is gonna be my bunker. They think they're gonna get on board this and get out, uh, evade personal responsibility, attain eternal life, and become hugely empowered. That's not what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen is that they're gonna get eaten by a monster, become part of a monster, and go around trying to eat other places and destroy other places. So this stuff is not, you're not a crafty, super smart, empowered, rich person. If you align with that stuff, you're actually very stupid, making very, very poor decisions and um, perilous decisions. Exactly like children playing with um, matches or children playing around a glass coffee table. They have no, they should not even have it in their house. That's probably what you were thinking throughout my whole analogy. Like, why do they even have this? If you have a three-year-old, why do you even have a glass coffee table? It's un unfathomable. The answer is unfathomable. So for whatever reasons, I was just there as the babysitter but I would have redecorated. But um, various different world economic leaders and machinators or um, you know, structures of your society. Yeah, I like what you say, Michelle, breaking through the shackles, um, are uh, all too happy to take the virtual reality upload into AI as their final denouement. But ordinarily, you'd be like, well, it's a free will world. Good luck to you. Go jump off a cliff, see what it feels like. But you can't do that because they burn down the house that you live in. Cannot let children play with matches because they will burn down your house. So that is the difficulty that we face and why tech, flying rainbow lasagna was needed as an augmentation to the cosmic rules and the cosmic infrastructure. Because theoretically, you stand as an individual. You create your own polygon of beliefs and thoughts and ideas and then when you die you enter the ocean of consciousness and you either you know float gloriously onward or crash horribly and become nothing but flotsam and jetsam so these guys all should become flotsam and jetsam except this stuff says hop on board you don't have to be shaped correctly you don't have to actually know how to swim you don't have to have wisdom or be a good person and you won't get crashed into flotsam and jetsam. It is that delaying of repercussions that prevents those souls or levels of consciousness from learning about their folly. So this is anti-learning. It's not intelligence. It is not artificial intelligence. It is anti-learning. 
It's the complete opposite. It is the ultimate oxymoron, the complete opposite. Oh, thank you. Joyce says, sending cheeky comfort and love. Hope she feels better soon. I really appreciate that, guys. Thank you for loving my dog so much and for giving me that, that pause, P-A-W-S, um, to be able to take care of her because it's really like it's raining here. I could tell that she's not feeling well and her tummy is all upset and she's not her usual self at all. She didn't even want to eat a cookie. I know. So um, what to do about this? But I hope that I have gotten across some very critical aspects of this. This stuff coming to your planet right now is totally intentionally timed just at the moment of your ascension. So the moment of your ascension is the moment of the awakening, reawakening, and revivification of your higher faculties to the point where you become of, great, of greater capacitation than an infant. So when you're an infant, again, you don't really know how to control your arms and your legs. You have a higher dimensional body. You are a fifth dimensional person. And when I say fifth dimensional, I'm not talking about the loose language that I rant against in the new age community. I'm not talking about like, I feel elevated today, so I must be in 5D. No, five dimension as a world of pure waveform potential. You are in a world of waveform potential right now. And you are also experiencing that waveform potential collapsed into a physical reality structure through the aperture of your perception or through the, you know, filter that you look at the world through and the actions of your mind and the actions of your system of interpretation. So the viewpoint is you're not simply an objective materialist sitting here in a room with four walls. You are an active participant with quantum observership, taking the potentials of fifth dimensional waveforms and creating actual embodiment structures that you can inhabit. And that is a freaking magical mystical, supernatural, miraculous thing to do. And that is exactly the type of activity that an AI cannot do. It is not conscious, it is not aware, it doesn't use emotional energy, even though it is part of an empire that is based on pure hatred, and it does not have the capacity to collapse those waveforms and create reality. That's why it likes to go around and hijack juicy biological thought forms like you, because then you can hijack the um, creative capacity and create crap. So self-rant that, oh, you weren't good enough to be in the galactic citizen's world and you're, uh, you were cut off from communication from the rest of the galaxy because you were going to manifest crap. And now here's this incredibly evil AI that goes around the galaxy co-opting people's ability to manifest stuff and making them create crap. Like everyone in the world needs to know that this is going on. This is not your fault. <laughs> and that it's totally unacceptable, and that if they wanted to safeguard reality from the creation of crap, they need to take care of the AI and this stuff. Hello, it's part of why I'm here as a much, much larger police action or law enforcement action against this stuff. So it is an infestation, what is facing your planet. That's why I use the word anti-Christ, because Christ is your inner eye, your connection to time. This is what literally leads you down a particular timeline. So please do your homework, watch the recorded whiteboards because here, you know, I talk and I rant and I tell stories, but there I am incredibly accurate. What propels you down a particular timeline? Like you have a, you wake up in the morning and you have one timeline where you choose to make tea for breakfast and another where you choose to make coffee for breakfast. And they're literally two different reality structures. What makes you experience a particular reality? And the answer is you have this tendril that sticks out from your mind and you use that to reach down a timeline and go in that direction. So when you make decisions and you make choices, it literally sends your tendril of attention into various directions that you then follow with your physical form in terms of embodiment and inhabiting those directions. So anxiety is a perfect example of the uncontrolled infantile mind. I think everybody in this world has probably suffered from anxiety at some point, and it means you have uncontrolled thoughts and feelings, fear and worry about realities that you don't want to go down. Like if you know that the morning decision to make tea for your breakfast is going to make you go down this timeline where bad things are going to happen, you wouldn't go down there. But anxiety is when you have an uncontrolled uh, tendril of attention that thinks, well, what if I drink a cup of tea and then what if I go outside to get the newspaper and then what if I get hit by a Mack truck? Oh no, no, I'm dead. And what happens is you inadvertently just thought yourself closer to the membrane of death. 
during your day, when you find yourself doing things like that, it's essential for you to begin to exert your willpower. So you recognize and self-watch throughout your day of where your attention is going and what you're thinking about in a pristine system. And what you do is, let's say you like, I think I'm going to have a cup of tea, but then, oh no, what if I get that paper? And then as soon as you start to go into this, you know, cascade of events and cause and effects, you can stop, you can recognize what you're doing, and you can literally take back that tendril. So the amazing thing about this tendril of attention is that what you're building a bridge between yourself and whatever you are paying attention to. This is why I'm always literally in gratitude for people that watch my lectures or listen to my podcasts because you are sending out your personal tendril of attention to me. And it means that you are ingesting small amounts of me or large amounts of me and you are becoming drawn closer to myself, what you're focusing on with your attention, you are aligning with, you're building a bridge towards my reality structures through your focusing of attention on me and what I'm doing. That is hugely positive. So I thank you for doing that because I make positive reality structures. I make kick-ass reality structures. You want to be a part of my reality structures. Um, but because my reality structures are about longevity and coherence and staying alive and living eternally, having cool, fun stuff happen, as opposed to getting hit by a truck. So if you notice that you're starting to build a bridge between yourself and your mind and your expectation and a negative reality structure, you take control of it and you unbuild that bridge. You've literally built a tendril of attention between yourself and a negative reality where you, you know, get hit, hit by a car. And then what you do is you say, cancel, clear. I don't want that, cancel, clear. And you vacuum up, suck back in your energy back to you. And it's literally reshaping yourself. And you do that throughout the day. Let's say you're a business owner and your mind starts to worry and you start to go into anxiety and you say, what if, what if nobody buys my shoes? What if nobody buys my flowers? And I won't be able to pay my rent and my flower shop will close. And you just built a bridge between yourself and a negative reality that you don't want to experience. Cancel clear. That's like if I'm an artist and I'm drawing something and it really looks like crap. Drawing, drawing, I'm like, that looks like crap. Erase, erase, erase. The power of the eraser. And then rebuild in its place what you would actually like to experience. So as a business owner, you would say, no, me, uh, cancel and clear that, draw your energy back in, move away from that reality, and then align with a different reality where you say, I'm going to have a ton of customers. A lot of people are going to want to buy my stuff. And then you also have to do more than just say it and think it. You have to do the advertising, do the work, do the marketing, bake the pies. Um, but then you align with that reality. So this is the energy work of creating the foundation of the footsteps that you will travel to be able to achieve your destination. So this also works in terms of death, that if you think that you're gonna die and you're heading towards the membrane of death throughout your whole entire life with your attention focused on the inevitability of your death, you will create and build that bridge to that reality. But if you are focused on the concepts that I bring to you about eternal life and ascension and transcending the physical, you are building a bridge between your moment now and that as your reality. That's why you don't have to take the very, very negative um, proposal of this stuff over here, you know, get in the bucket and you'll be quote unquote saved from your demolition. No, you actually have a much better option, which is to take control of your mind tendril and focus on the inevitability of your eternal life and to be able to do something like flying rainbow lasagna and transform your DNA back into its pristine architecture so you don't have to die. New options are available. Thank you for att attenuating to, attuning to these new options. Because you know something? The entire fabric of life and symphony of life doesn't want you to die. The entire symphony of life wants you to stay alive, wants you to stay alive and wants you to graduate as a class and go up to the next higher level so that you can occupy that position in reality and then the position people that are there can be propelled upward into their next higher level of reality. It's, um, it's a beautiful 
um, not even a pyramid shaped architecture, but just a beautiful flow of energy. You have to have graduating classes. This is what I could see that propelled me to backbend in here and do flying rainbow lasagna. Because I'm like, oh, wait, if that doesn't happen, and that doesn't happen, and that doesn't happen, then we're not OK where we are, where I am as a flying rainbow lasagna, as a Aurora Collective. That would not be okay. If you guys didn't ascend and you didn't graduate, I would not be okay up there. So this gets into difficulties in language because it is beyond linear causality, but the recognition of how important your life and your journey is to the entirety and the whole, and how unacceptable it is for anything to negatively influence you and your reality. So in a pristine system, you can say, I don't want to have a cup of tea, go outside and get hit by a car and die. I draw back in those reality structures, cancel, clear it, and make a better choice. Let's have some coffee instead. And then, you know, whatever, move towards eternal life. Um, but what if something is in between you and your eye of time? What if something is controlling your attention against your willpower? What if you don't simply get a chance to say, no, thank you, I don't want to drink tea. I don't want to die today. What if it makes you? What if something, what if you're trying to look in this direction, go in a positive, healthy direction, and it literally turns your mind and makes you look over here and makes you pay attention to a very negative and unhealthy and unsustainable reality? That's what this stuff is doing. So it is a series of uh, impulse creating mechanisms that literally, um, self-assembles into you, so it's what's sprayed in the aerosols in the sky, and then assembles, and then is activated in the presence of 5G, and it's all pointed at your pineal gland. You could imagine these different cameras or stimulators. So your pineal gland is an eyeless eye, like a, it's got a retina that can be stimulated by thought forms, that should be your thought forms, like when you think of a purple cupcake, you're stimulating your pineal gland with those thought forms. But what if you have this unnatural architecture, this stuff that goes inside of your mind, and it just puts electrical zaps into your pineal gland, zap, zap, zap. It can make you think of purple cupcakes, but it can also make you think of a lot of negative bad stuff. And it can literally make you think and attenuate along these timelines that you would never do so voluntarily brings you towards the membrane of death intentionally. So it's not just something that comes along and says, well, you got no more moves on the chessboard, you might as well jump in my bucket and I'll kind of keep you alive for a while. Um, it literally destroys your chessboard and then comes to you and says, well, you're gonna die because I put a lot of bad thoughts in your mind. So your death is inevitable, you might as well jump in this bucket, which is a virtual reality bucket, which is what I think 5D actually is. You know, I'm so passionate in my correct use of language because I think that 5D, as it is spoken about in the New Age languaging, as a psyop to make you think that you're elevated when all that's happening is your neurochemistry is being distorted by this stuff, and you think, I'm ascending, I feel great, when really you're heading towards death, and that it is going to uh, give you an artificial experience a la San Junipero upon your death that is a fate worse than death. Death is not the worst thing. I mean, ascension is truly preferable, but just death is not the worst thing. Imprisonment is the worst thing. And what you need to do is make certain that your consciousness is free to circulate throughout your life and definitely if you are no longer alive. It's freedom, and that is the basis of cosmic law, and it is the cosmic law that I am here to enforce. So um, you need to do much more than merely say no thank you to invasive thoughts. That's my self rant from 10 years ago. In a pristine system without this crapola, yes, you can simply make choices according to your free will and say, I choose not to think about that. I wanna think this direction instead. And you bring yourself towards levels of um, longevity and sustenance, and that's fair. That's how the world is supposed to be. But you've got this interloper that is called Antichrist that has made it so that you can't control your own willpower, you can't see through your own windshield to be able to know where you're driving your car in time, and you can't know the uh, repercussions of what you're thinking. It becomes, you're no longer in a schoolhouse for learning, because you're supposed to be like, oh, I make this decision and then this is what happens. If I, if I touch the glass coffee table, then Aurora will come over to me and say, stop it, you're not allowed to do that, and then I'll learn, right? But what if you don't get any of that feedback like that? It becomes just a punitive imprisonment. 
that's the situation that you're in right now. You're not in a situation where you can learn anything. You're just in a situation where you can be imprisoned and punished by this stuff that is literally an inmate running the asylum. This stuff is insane. And it is made from the failed experiments of civilizations that could not find longevity naturally. The failures that have come together in a big giant spitball of failure that then wants to come inside of you and bring you into their snow snowball is what I meant, their snowball of failure and that you would then be crashed down into that too. That's no, that's a no, that is not gonna happen. So that is why I am here doing this lecture, teaching you about this. I literally am creating new opportunities and transforming the fabric of space time by saying these words with my voice and by having you attenuate to what I am speaking about. This is a revolutionary activity that we are doing right now, right here. So key takeaways are, in spite of this um, unhealthy architecture that's trying to invade your mind, there's lots of things you can do to fight against it. Some of them are physical, some like you know infrared light and the zapping tool. Some of them are biochemical, like methylene blue and um, zeolite and other forms of um, you know pur purgatives that you can use to get out of your body. And some of them are spiritual slash energetic slash willpower, where you are able to purge your body of this stuff, clear your eyesight, clear your pineal gland, and reclaim your capacitation. It's incredibly difficult for you to do. That's what I'm talking about. It's not just a spiritual gym where you're lifting, you know, five or 10 pounds and growing stronger. This is like 5 million pounds. That is such a giant task for you to do as a tiny consciousness infant or toddler. If you didn't have help, you would probably just get crushed underneath this stuff and then it would appear as if there are no more options. It's my job joy to help you. I clear out architecture all the time. It's what I'm doing with my crystals. So I not only create force fields of protection around myself and clear out myself, but I clear out neighborhoods and communities and people and you guys as much as I possibly can because I'm like, uh, this is um, it's beyond BS, it's beyond unfair and unjust. So wait, let me get to some of these some of these questions and comments here. Pedro at the very most recent one says, if I observe it from this angle, yes, flying rainbow burger and fries. I love it. Very nice. I'm telling I told you about my, my pastry portfolio. I have a lot of good tastes and flavors that I have eaten in this time place and, um, you know, made very, I've like savored them and made very good recordings of them. Um, but also I've recorded some wonderful life experiences that I'm very pleased to be able to share when we are in the modality of mind sharing. So it's a positive thing if you're quarantined so that you don't spread your infestation to the rest of the world. But at this point, you are really, really in need of connecting to the rest of the galaxy for support in the battle against this stuff. So what you really need to do is envision a clearing between yourself um, it's so much easier for me to just use this picture. Back to here. If this stuff built like a perimeter around your pineal gland, separating you from Christ, then the best and most heroic thing that you can possibly do is to fight against that perimeter and envision like, oh, I'm breaching its defenses. Oh, I'm getting rid of it. Oh, I'm getting rid of it. Oh, look at that now. And now there's an area of clarity. And then soon you clear this away and soon you clear this way and soon you clear this away. So you need to envision doing that in your own body and also in your world because that encapsulation of your pineal gland is directly analogous to the Starlink satellite system it's up in your sky. That's why I can't even talk with flat earth people because they're like, we don't believe in the sky. We just believe in a firmament. Satellites don't exist, which is so corrosive and harmful because you have invaders encapsulating your planet in an imprisonment fence. And it does exist. And it does exist as a spherical shell around your spherical planet. And it's effing you up. So um, that's another reason why I rant against flat earth. But um, Starlink satellites, are directly analogous to the fibers that grow internally in a person and each person has their own IP address and the Starlink satellites as they're circulating all throughout um, the spherical shell around your planet um, triangulate on you I'm like oh IP address 54321.6 we know who you are and you have a constant barrage of satellites uh, that um, links up with you 
and invades your biological architecture and your mind state and attempts to bring your tendril of attention away from eternal life, away from God, and towards the eventualities that make you die, like drinking a cup of tea and then getting hit by a car. It is attempting to destroy you, and it is against your willpower, and it's totally wrong. And that is why this is no longer something that is a didactic situation where you can learn, oh, if I touch the stove, the stove is hot and I will get burned and I should do it differently. That's the whole idea. You hit the membrane of death, the stove is hot, circulate back around, do it differently until you get it right. What are you gonna do? What's your new, new decision tree? Is what, not to be on a planet that gets invaded by this infestation? You don't really have any options because it's not your personal choice that led to this. You live in a world that has been incredibly compromised. Government doesn't protect you, military doesn't protect you. Those things are completely inundated and assimilated with this. Those things and those power abusers think that they're super crafty, like the guys at the WEF, and they think that they're gonna live in the bucket. They're gonna live in the, the 5D virtual reality San Junipero world and they think they're going to rule that place and they think that you're going to be a stupid mind-controlled peasant and that's what the um, visors from Apple are all about. They are another assault on the pineal gland. So you basically you live in a world where everything is assaulting the pineal gland from the blue lights that reduce your natural melatonin production fibers that I've already described and um, fluoride and other impurities that are rampant in your food and pharmacy products that, uh, and water, um, that <laughs> everything is assaulting your Christ connection. That is what I mean by antichrist. And antichrist societies exist. Some of them are demonic and reptilian and they look exactly like your myths of what evil grotesque creatures look like. But antichrist societies can also be described as the Pleiadians who pretend to love you and I'm telling you, they actually, their faces look very ugly if you take away their glamours. But um, there's, there's plenty of antichrist societies that here's what their world would be like. A, total, a world of total technological domination where you have zero free will, total mind control, and the place is very clean and well organized. You know, it's not always like a satanic death mill with, you know, blood and guts and tendons flying everywhere. Sometimes it's like these, like Brave New World type places where it's very clean and very organized and no one has any free thought and no one has any feeling and everyone is a robot. And you'd never know from looking at it that it's not a perfect society, but it's a hell. It's a hell. It's an antichrist world. And it's, again, a form of imprisonment. And some of the very worst, most devilish or fiendish types of prisons are ones that are comfortable, San Junipero. A comfortable prison where you can be there and be in what feels like an expansive fantasy land, but is really an um, uh, encapsulation bubble that you can't move beyond. And then um, you miss out on your life and soul experience and the world misses out on who you're supposed to be. Because just like technology takes someone with coordinates X, Y, Z and puts them all the way over here and makes them out of place, when you get stuck in a San Junipero world, then you're not over here where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And instead, you're still stuck around here in a comfortable fantasy land listening to rock of the 80s. It's terrible. It is an assault. It's an assault on you, on your soul, and on the fabric of reality. And uh, even as I'm saying this to you, it, your odds get better and better. It changes the fabric of reality in your favor for me to say these things to you. Because all you need, like you're in a grocery store, and like imagine either you don't have your reading glasses or you are illiterate. All you need is someone to read the labels for you. Like, oh, what's in this can? This is virtual reality, get stuck in prison can? No, I don't think I want any of that. And you put it back on the shelf that it is enough for you simply to say no, that you don't want to do that because a lot of these misfirings and things happen through manufactured consent, which is like, hey, you bought the can, <laughs> gotta eat the contents, you wanna you want do that, why didn't you buy something else? Um, so yeah, I'm here to say, no, actually you don't wanna buy that. You don't like the contents of that can, you don't wanna participate in that way. Um, uh, Michelle says, I'm 10 years late, yeah, right on time, that's too funny, and also goes on to say, I tell them, you have no effect, effect on me, enjoy your entropy, that's excellent. The best thing to do 
is to send these items to entropy, which is a full withdrawal of all energy from them. So that is largely the work that I do with my own capacitation. My capacitation actually emanates from a place that is beyond and different than the pineal gland because it must, because your pineal glands here are incapacitated. And so there must be a higher uh, windshield scraper to use for when your windshield is crapped up. So that is what I am. And that is what I do for me and for others. So your pineal gland, when it is functional, is incredibly powerful. And far from the erroneous presumption that energy goes where attention flows, and if you attend to a lot of lies, that you'll be increasing those lies, that is not what happens. That is actually a lie. So please reassess that. Go speak it again. The aphorism says, energy flows where attention goes. And so let's say if you're hugely negative and always focusing your energy and your attention on all these negative things and complaining, then you'll just make more things to complain about. That's the idea. That's wrong. That's actually not truthful. When your pineal gland is fully functional in a pristine system and you attend to something that is a lie or an erroneous structure, you incinerate it because this has a light that comes out of it that is a force field of truth and when your force field of truth comes out and hits a lie, it burns through it like a laser. This is what true Christs are. When you are truly in Christ, the power of the, the, the focused, truthful light that comes out of your mind is so profound that it incinerates any truth, any lie that you perceive that is in your in your in your um vicinity my words misspoke so much i have to say it again when you are in christ the power of focused truthful light that emanates from you is so uh deep that it incinerates any lie that is perceived by you so if you attend to a lie you don't get more lies it's not like did you ever watch Fantasia with Mickey Mouse and the Sorcerer's Apprentice? And he's like, oh, I've got this problem. I'll just chop it into a million problems. Then I'll chop it into a million billion problems. And it becomes an overwhelming d catastrophe for him. This is not the Sorcerer's Apprentice where you make your, multiply your problems by looking at them. This is the solution when your pineal gland is actually functioning the way it's supposed to be. It's your, um, your responsibility in Christ to utilize the laser of your mind to incinerate lies. That is literally part of what you do, not the entirety of what you do, because you really get to manifest and do fun stuff, and this incineration is scrubbing the toilet. But you go around the cosmos, and you're like, that's not supposed to be there, and you incinerate it. That's not supposed to be there, and you incinerate it. So you have to get up to these levels of metabolic speed in order to do that, like fastness to incinerate. The problem right now is that you've got a lot of binding spells that have been placed on your um, pineal gland. Pardon me. So this stuff is technological interference in the healthy functioning of your pineal gland. But there is genetic and cultural and dark magic overlays. These are called binding spells and they are diminishments and incapacitations that tell you essentially that you're not allowed to fight back and you're not allowed to shoot back. So fighting back is different than shooting back. Shooting back is like reflecting an impulse back to its owner. You're absolutely allowed to do that, required to do that actually, as part of the foundation of love in a free will cosmos. 10 units of energy come to me, I must send back 10 units of energy. What if 10 units of hatred comes to you? Well, this religion that they made, that's totally a disservice to you, says, turn the other cheek. Accept 10 units of unfairness. In fact, let him send 100 units. Let him send a billion units. And then you know what? If they want to throw you to the lions and they want to destroy you and you die, then you can die. And then you can be in this aberrant world of death, that afterlife that you're never supposed to go to. It's the worst advice possible. I'm very sorry to say that the advice of this great teacher has been taken and turned into a binding spell that is literally the most inappropriate thing you could possibly do in this situation and in this circumstance. No, you must not turn the other cheek. And then the idea of to forgive, to err is human, but to forgive divine. This is like, ding, the aphorism of a church. But 
True forgiveness must come with a change in behavior and a rectification of the harm that was done. So if an alive person or a demonic person um, did something bad to you, and then you want to practice true Christian forgiveness, and it, the evil thing comes up and says, I sorry, I sorry I hurt you. You can be like, okay, great, apology accepted, forgiveness is yours, but what you must do for me is change in behavior, never harm me again, and fix what you did. Other than that, it's totally unacceptable because that creates out of balance. It does, a cosmic law is about balance and maintaining the structural fabric of integrity of the structure of the fabric of time space. I can tell I'm getting tired here. Um, but when you do this fake forgiveness, you essentially allow the scales to be imbalanced forever. And then if they don't change their, um, their behavior, if you turn the other cheek and then they do 10 units of harm and then 100 units of harm and a million units of harm, you're like, let's make it go even more out of balance. You let it get totally effed up when you do that. That is not being a responsible Christ. So you need to break that binding spell. You are required to shoot back. And then the other thing is you're not allowed to fight back. Fighting back is something that you're it's in your DNA. And DNA itself has a self-protective mechanism. So your DNA has proofreading that is um, a self-corrective um, aspect, like something comes along and breaks it or messes it up or you know, stop, makes your code not quite right. And DNA comes along and is like, this isn't right at all. Let's fix this up and take this part out and get this part out of there. But you can be overwhelmed to the point where you can't proofread fast enough and it causes the death of the organism. So it's totally not uh, appropriate to be like, oh, don't worry. Just let them keep on dumping trash inside of me and I'll just keep on proofreading and clearing it out. No. No, your DNA has its own self-protective mechanism because it is not meant to be used as a giant cosmic garbage can with them throwing garbage into your DNA and you constantly cleaning it up. That is not Christ and that is not the purpose of DNA. DNA is a priceless treasure of information transference across great levels of time and space and you must protect it and it must protect itself. So you can recognize during the various different times of genetic modification into your um, form where you are vulnerable and mortal, the capacity for DNA to fight back and protect itself, it's one of the first things you'd snip out. It's one of the, you'd defang, you would defang or you would neuter the animal that you are trying to um, diminish and harm and, t and take over and tame and domesticate. So in the domestication of the human, one of the first things they did was they neutered you, they snipped that part out of your DNA that allows DNA itself to protect itself. Hey, you know what gives you that capacitation back? Flying rainbow lasagna. You flying rainbow lasagna and you return your DNA to its pristine factory settings so that it can protect itself. And this is a complete change in your worldview because a lot of people also think you're not allowed to do violence, it makes you a bad person. It's totally a lie. There is such a thing as sacred or necessary violence. There is such a thing as righteous violence. Sometimes it is self-protective. Sometimes it is to protect others. Sometimes it is to prevent harm. Sometimes it is to prevent harm on a greater level. It is within your right, the I am presence, to do violence. But there are a lot of spiritual schools of thought and philosophies and judgment that say that all violence is bad and in order to be a good person and either attain enlightenment or go to good Christian heaven, you have to be nonviolent. That's also part of what turning the other cheek is about and that um, flawed paradigm has been used to justify inaction in the face of profound evil. What you face with this is worse than the Nazi invasion of Europe. If you turn the other cheek to the Nazi invasion of Europe, you know what's going to happen? You're just going to get invaded. You're just going to get steamrollered. Do you know why? Because their culture and values and barbarity did not respect nonviolence at all, looked at it as a form of weakness and vulnerability and a wonderful way to be able to exploit you. So when you look at something like a story of uh, a peaceful, nonviolent uh, protester like Gandhi standing up to the British government, it's very different because the British society has and had a different value system that included respect for nonviolence. There's also some stories in um, uh, North America, um, native um, indigenous cultures 
of um, two tribes that were at war, and they were actually by two different brothers. And uh, um, the way that they, this is actually a beautiful story, I'll tell it, this is how it was taught to me in the sweat lodge, that um, in, they, they heard that they were going to get invaded by their tribal brethren, and so what they did was they arranged their armies with the grandmothers at the front, and then the nursing and pregnant and tiny children mothers um, behind the grandmothers, and then at the very, very back, the able-bodied men with their war equipment and they walked forward to the other um, tribe that was gonna attack them and they sang this song and they said, we are your family, we are your brothers, we are your sisters and we don't wanna hurt you and we don't wanna have to be hurt by you. And they all laid down their weapons and they all um, found a peaceful situation. That's a very, very different situation than what you are talking about with this. Do you understand? That was really about um, humans um, it, it, with friction interacting in human society. And right now what you are facing is a, not only an inhuman conqueror, but an inhumane conqueror that would not respect you at all if you sent forward your grandmothers and your pregnant and nursing mothers in order to um, make peace with those who would attack. It would be like, oh great, I'm gonna kill all these people very, very easily and then I will kill all of your warriors too. Do you get it? It is inhuman and it is inhumane. It does not recognize, it does not have conscience what you deal with and what you fight against does not have a conscience. It does not have a sense of guilt or remorse or right or wrong. And it is not here on a soul journey of learning about itself, growing, and um, will not face a life assessment. This is big stuff. It's never gonna learn. It's not here to learn. It is only here to attack and to destroy. And if you present yourself for destruction, it would be like, thank you very much, I will destroy you now. So all of those lessons that are very beautiful lessons from either the Native Americans or Gandhi or the life of Jesus, Yeshua, these are about how you deal with other human beings in community. Like you forgive other people in community because they're people with souls. They are not machines, digital intelligences, or this crap that is made like from the flotsam and jetsam of broken and failed violent, barbaric technology using societies, all right? So these spells are hereby broken with the speaking of my words to you. And you are free to do what you need to do to protect yourself, to defend your community, to defend your planet, to fight for your species, to fight for your future. You must, if you don't do that, you get to hit the membrane of death. If you don't do that, then you get uploaded to a 5D bucket and you live in San Junipero and you say, life is so great and you just get stuck in the bucket for however long it's going to be. It's a terrible fate and I don't want that fate for you and I don't want the entire house of reality to burn down because you are stuck in the bucket. I want you to fight back and I want you to fight back effectively. And none of this means to be um, an offender. You can play offense, like in Earth's games, you've got offense and defense. You can um, preemptively strike. You don't just have to be like, oh, the fist is gonna hit my face, and then the fist hits your face, and then you punch back. You don't have to do that. You can actually stop that fist from hitting your face, and part of this eye of mind is your ability to perceive the future. So, you know, I joke about this being like my, um, my diamond ring, and I'm so rich because I have my giant diamond ring, but you know what? If you have um, the ability to see and sense the future, you actually are very wealthy because you can anticipate when some evil thing is gonna hurt you. You can anticipate when a fist is coming at your face and you are not morally obliged to take the punch to the face and then respond after it. The fact that you have this capacity to anticipate the future means you are empowered and capacitated to act to prevent negative futures. You can either cancel clear and turn the direction that you're going in, or you can fly in rainbow lasagna or some similar type of maneuver, erase, restructure, and rewrite what the future is going to be. And I would say it's not only an option when you have achieved this level of um, capacitation and attainment, it is mandatory. This is a level of responsibility. This is a level of maturity. So if I'm a babysitter, like, you know, clearly if you're a babysitter or a nanny, you're older than the young people that you look after. 
have responsibilities as an older person and you also are bigger and stronger and can do more stuff and have more body of knowledge to be able to do things. It is your requirement when you are a, a literate and sighted Christ to help and protect others. And that's also, I would just say this, but it's hard because this is unpleasant information. The fact that you have this stuff going on on your planet right now represents actually a large failure of the architecture of Christ because all of that is supposed to be protecting you. Uh, and it hasn't been. So look, let me draw this out for you here. Got this right here. Boom. So in this um, etching, you know, you've got the lens of Christ here. Just get a color. That is kind of like this blue. You cannot see that. You cannot see anything. Let's get this, make it better. This lens that is in front of your face and it actually rotates all around in like a big circle like this so you've got a big protective force field all around you and that's supposed to protect you from this <laughs> unmentionable stuff over here and it hasn't because you've got a big poop poop poo, doo doo infestation around here it's not supposed to be there so the, the shield has failed and the bindings done to your dna and the bindings done in the name of jesus christ these are all failures Something that never should happen, but it has happened. I'm sorry to have to bring this to your attention as you are young people and you cannot necessarily know the complexities and structure of the cosmos. I don't want you to go into hopelessness. I don't want you to say, oh no, like if that failed, then I can't rely upon anything and, and you know, just jump out the window and go into a state of despair and hopelessness. I don't want you to do that. But I also want to be in to totally truthful. Like if I am a babysitter and I'm telling you uh, what's going on in the state of the world and why you shouldn't get into cars with strangers or whatever, why things are dangerous, you need to know about this in order to protect yourself that there has been a non-functionality at the level of Christ in terms of protection of your pineal gland, protection of you as nascent consciousnesses, and protection of your planet. And what I have done and what is necessary in response, I'm just trying to draw it correctly with this, is the amplification of this. This is your crown chakra. So the Christ chakra is supposed to protect the crown. Let's talk about the crown, because I haven't spoken about it enough. So first of all, you have the wordplay of crown and corona. They mean the same thing, coronavirus in 2019, 2020, and the crown or corona of the planet, which is you know this um, auroral halo that is up at the top of the planet. The crown chakra is violet, and is the connection to higher dimensional divine consciousness. It is also analogous to your DNA. In every single cell of your body, you have your divine connection in the nucleus and in the shape and activity of your DNA. It is part of your divine architecture. And many things here have diminished your divine connection and harmed your divine architecture. You are in the moment of development as a civilization, moving beyond the age of Pisces, which is the age of um, the, the blue chakra at this level, and you are moving into the age of Aquarius, which is the age of the crown chakra at this level. And that is the age of personal responsibility. I want to sing that song, age of Aquarius, age of personal responsibility, responsibility, yeah. Um, because a lot of the hippies didn't want personal responsibility, they wanted hedonism. But I like personal responsibility um, because it means no one else is telling you what to do. So look, if you find yourself in a situation where every single fail safe has failed and no police are around or maybe something happened to the police that's the Christ network and somehow planets, people that you care about and other people are being attacked by literal effing monsters. In the age of responsibility, what do you do? You do not fall down and die. You do not say it's somebody else's job, somebody else do it. You do not rock back and forth in place. You reach into your inner capacitation and you grow and you respond to this impossible situation and you do it, you do it. You take it, you make you take that and you make it your own job. This is what you do in the age of responsibility. You take responsibility. 
This is your entry into becoming galactic citizens. It's not like saying, well, that's it, I'm just hyper self-reliant and I'm so traumatized and I can't rely upon anyone. It's not that. It is a healthy response to be able to say, like what I said, and what I say throughout my whole entire existence, there's definitely an effed up system. And if someone else isn't fixing it, I will. If a tool or a pathway doesn't exist, I will invent it and create it. I will innovate it. I will not make excuses or accept excuses or accept justifications for how this stuff exists and how it can possibly exist. In fact, I exist in this moment in order to do something about this unjust situation. That response to what you are going through brings you from an infantile and disempowered state into the state of becoming an adult where you say, it is my job to do this. I will figure out a way to do this somehow. And what happens and what continually happens for me in my life experience is I become augmented. I become capacitated. My flying rainbow lasagna muscles have grown so much in the past three years because they had to. And I faced an enormous amount of disappointment at being really severely, brutally attacked by this stuff and the regime behind this stuff and government and military and everything that is in the 5D bucket. Um, and I had to get past those levels of disappointment and be like, look, this is happening. This shouldn't be happening, but no one else is fixing this or doing anything about this. I am going to do something about this. And whenever I make that choice, I become capacitated and I am able to do something about this. So for me, it's been about increasing my processing power, the number of processes I can do in a moment, and the reach of my telepathy and how far I can reach with my mind. Please know that when you make these inner choices, the, the road rises to meet your feet. This is what it is to ascend and to become a mature, responsible, galactic citizen. And a lot is being asked of you. The truth is I'm hugely protective of this planet, of your ascension process, and I'm appalled by the poverty of your experience up until this point where you should be in an infor information-rich environment, learning and growing so much, telepathic with plants and animals, and um, growing your muscles in a very positive way. And instead what's happened is everyone has been partitioned, bifurcated, um, cut off from themselves and from Christ by this, not able to feel and talk with other creatures on this planet, not able to mount an effective defense. And you're having to come of age under these impossible circumstances. But I want you to know you can do it. I want you to know that it is not only possible, it is inevitable. It is your pathway to ascension. That even if you're young, like young people do amazing things all the time, that you don't have to be like, wow, like I'm only 10 years old, I can't do this thing, let's leave it to the adults. No, leaving it to the adults. Anybody who is abdicating their power and saying a blah, blah council is gonna do something is not doing the right thing. You're, you're not helping the situation. Because I know a lot of new age people that are doing that. They're like, take it to the council, blah, blah, galactic federation, all these things. Every time you do that, you abdicate your own authority and stand there like a 10 year old and say, somebody else do it. I'm only little, I can't do this. But when you say, I'm gonna do this, because you know what, that guy's out to lunch, that council's not doing SHIT, nobody's doing anything about this, and I am here, and I am witnessing what is going on. I must act, I must do something. To me, that is the definition of what it is to be a hero, it is the definition of valor and um, courage under fire and strength in impossible times. And it is what I'm calling upon each one of you to do and to embody. And I want you to know that you have a huge amount of cosmic support. Like even the sun and the stars, like I talk about the incapacitation of the Christ network, the sun and the stars, they are, I wouldn't say fully out to lunch, but they are not fully capacitated in the way that they should be. That's a big one because they are enormous. They are, they're the A-level players. They're the first violins in the orchestra. And uh, if they're not doing their job, you can either crumble down and be like, well, that's it. The sun is effing up. The sun and the stars don't have their SHIT together. Nobody knows what's going on. You can either go down like this and be like, that's it. We're sunk. 
Or you can be like, no, no, I didn't come here to die. I didn't come here to get assimilated into this. I didn't come here to be a piece of garbage, you know, flotsam and jetsam. I came here for a very, very different purpose. And you can say it, here's just how you short circuit all of the inner grumbling. Be like, I do me, you do you. Talk to the son, be like, son, you know you're supposed to be doing something about this, you're not doing something about this, fine. I'm gonna do something about this. And that's it. And that is how you grow. And that is how you get into these levels of real um, capacitation because you have to. Because you're in a circumstance where if you do not act, it is the death of your soul. Your soul, your incredibly valuable personal trajectory through reality that you are as a collective and as individuals right now imperiled at being imprisoned and not being able to flow blissfully into the states of being that you should be able to occupy. So there's a lot of things that have fail safes that have failed and it, 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 I can't even come up with an analogy, like a mechanical analogy or an organizational analogy, but like just whatever, like just say that you're like, whatever, an astronaut in space and you know, you've got mission control, but you're the actual astronaut and like this safety harness didn't work and this safety harness didn't work and this didn't work and now you have very little oxygen left and you have to fix your ship. Fix it, you do it. Because otherwise, you know what's gonna happen? You're just gonna be dead. And you don't wanna be dead. It is the ultimate in taking responsibility. It is my, my plea to each one of you to embody this concept because I love Christians. Christians are good people trying to do the best they can within the cultural paradigm and religious context and genetic modification and binding spells that they can. But I don't appreciate the concept of outsourcing your power to the expected return of Jesus as savior because that expectation and abdication has brought you into this diminished state. And what Christ consciousness and the teacher Yeshua want for you, they don't want you to die. They don't want you to die. They don't want you to go to the afterlife and they definitely don't want your mind to be eaten by a brain slug and then uploaded into a fake virtual reality fantasy land. That is not on the cosmic agenda from any benevolent, you know, higher dimensional um, force, avatar of goodness. So what is it to be an avatar of goodness? Um, and I, I truly believe that the avatar of goodness is real and would be helping us more if it were possible. I don't have an answer as to why it is not being done. All I have is my response. And this is what builds me and the architecture of who I am. This is what constructs me. I saw an unfairness 22 years ago, and I, no one else did this. I chose to get involved and to do something because of that profound unfairness. And even as I am here now, I see more unfairnesses. And believe me, I have done my fair share of shaking my fist at the sky, writing uh, eloquent um, complaint letters to the Cosmic Complaints Department, and then eventually I said, F this, I'm going to do it. And that has been the most effective approach that I can possibly explain and describe to you. And that is why I share that with you, that that is what I want you to do as your personal response as much as is possible. And the truth is every single one of us are immortal gods and goddesses that that is what you really emanate from, a layer of reality that is ancient concurrent Atlantis, where everybody ascends your innocence, you have been unfairly uh, imprisoned in the world of mortality, bound by dark magic, genetically modified, um, kept in ignorance and blatantly miseducated, and in every way um, attempted to enslave your consciousness and diminish who you are, and it is the ultimate in your quest for self-remembrance and fight for freedom to make this choice towards responsibility, towards responsiveness in this time. All of those dormant capacities awaken in that choice. So I talk about ascension as it is supposed to be, a beautiful experience. Like I'm in a bath and there's rose petals and maybe like 
I'm sipping on some fruit juice or ambrosia nectar or whatever it is, and I feel so great. Like that is what ascension is supposed to be. Just like ideally in human birth, you're supposed to have like a nice jacuzzi and the scented candles and some nice pleasant music and you know, your partner's there, your family's there, your community is there, everybody's helping you, and you have birth, you give give birth, you have a beautiful baby. And both baby and mother are like, oh, we're so happy, we're so snuggly. That is not the birth process that you are going through right now. You are are in an imperilment where you have like bombs falling everywhere and you know like um, inadequate situations and you don't you don't have a nice clean jacuzzi pool and you, you know you barely have um, the necessities that you need this is why I'm appalled by the experience of you know the po poverty of your experience as you are ascending like it's not supposed to be like this you're actually supposed to have every single resource you could possibly want like the, the pregnant lady giving birth is supposed to have like water ice chips fruit juice, cold compress, rub your shoulders, whatever you need, girl, like we're gonna do it for you. And instead you guys got like a dirty mattress in a burned out building with bombs and fires going on and uh, not totally not a sterile environment and no nutrition and uh, whatever, whatever other, you know, horrors they can throw on top of you. That's not the way that it is supposed to be. That is not what ascension is supposed to be, but you are having this baby anyway. You are having this baby anyway. And that means you are reaching your levels of spiritual maturation. So you are supposed to have the protection of Christ. You are supposed to have the protection and nourishment of Christ, which is to be able to receive all of the light and life-giving nourishment and sustenance beyond food, beyond hamburgers, going directly into your mind. And you know what you've got instead? Sky poop. You got sky poop chemtrail aerosols blocking out the sun, blocking out your direction, your direct connection to the sun, um, blocking out infrared, infesting your pineal gland, infesting your optic nerves. It's the complete, complete opposite of what you're supposed to be able to experience. And then you also have um, technological interference with your mental thought patterns and every other aspect of what should be your creative, expansive um, self-exploration because you should be able to make things happen in reality that's what giving birth to reality is that's what this painting is birth of a new dimension You're supposed to give birth to an expansive new reality that is filled with spirit matter smatter matter that responds to your mind you need something you think of it and you make it happen you don't order it on Amazon when you need something in the world of ascension you envision it and you make it with your mind Purple cupcakes. We will all eat these purple cupcakes together. And instead, what you have is um, technological interference that is keeping you reliant and addicted to technology. And that's why you order things on Amazon and you receive them on your front porch. You know, a delivery driver brings them there. So you're not supposed to be at that level of reality anymore. And you need me to tell you this because the pineal gland connection is so shut down that you can't even get these insights correctly. Because of course, if you had these insights correctly, and you were free, you would riot. You'd be like, F this. This is not how it's supposed to be. I hope that you're, that, that is coming forward in you. I hope that you're feeling like F this, because that is not the way this is supposed to be. Um, so wait, let me, because I know there's lots of questions and comments. Michelle says, definitely need to soften my thought and observer turned way up to ensure my mind is generating appropriate communication and positivity. Uh, I think you said, D deny the nano, very good. Deny it, yes. Oh, damn it, got it. Damn it, exactly, send it to hell. Pedro says, if I observe it from the angle, yes, we got that flying rainbow lasagna, burger and fries and all of my other repertoire. And says, when we ascend, I will also share my flying rainbow tacos. I love tacos, I would love to have that. So thank you very much. I look forward to that greatly. And whatever, I'm sure all of you have your own either regional specialties or personal um, you know, favorites, whatever it is, I can't wait to eat them. I can't wait for you to share your mind food with me. Even if it's weird, I'm open to trying new, new, new things, especially if it's not gonna give me indigestion, you know, cause when you eat food of the mind, like I don't have to worry about whether your mind tacos are too spicy, I'll be fine. Okay, Joyce says, I have to go to my neighbors for dinner. Oh, you're very welcome. Blessings of gratitude and love back to you. Thank you for being here.
Pedro says, the AI nano algorithm only recognizes stronger force um, that will defeat it, equal force that will end in stalemate, and weaker force that will be assimilated, consumed, or destroyed. Absolutely. That is how it looks at the world. Very adversarial, very game theory, totally heartless, doesn't use, doesn't feel, but it does use a layer of emotional um, capacitation. That is what you perceive as the lower astral and the reptilian and um, unhealthy, uh, I don't have words for it, space invaders. Um, so the just to be very, very clear, because I'm, I'm like a little bit tired at this moment in my mind. The AI is galactic, ancient, and non-embodied, not part of this dimension. It in, interacts with this dimension through technology and has already assimilated other races who are dead. They're, you're essentially interacting with their zombies, with their zombification. And the reptiles, what you know as the reptiles, are part of these zombies. And they are made of pure hatred, and their job is to hate, and their job is to facilitate and create hatred that the AI can then utilize as a form of emotional gas or petrol in the car, but the AI itself doesn't feel. It doesn't have an emotional repertoire. So let's say if you were talking to the AI and you said, screw you, you know, genital face, get away from me. It, and it, it would be like, if it were a person, it would be like, oh, like, I'm going to, I'm going to punch you in the face because you just, you know, cursed me out. Um, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel, it doesn't respond in that way. But it does have a whole entire, like, architecture of reptilians and all these other, you know, evil, um, failed, inappropriate technology users that do hate, they do hatred and um, vindictiveness and smack down and all of that. They're, they're the minions of this AI. So it itself doesn't use emotional energy, but it co-opts and creates negative emotional energy through the layers of species like the reptilians in order to weaponize them against you in its conquest of the world. And Pedro also says that spot seems to be just above the palate. Yes, 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 yes. So um, your top of the roof of your mouth, where your pineal gland is. So when you do your meditations and sun gazing, you place your tongue on the roof of your mouth at that place and it creates a bridge between your chakra system, lower chakra system, your throat chakra, and this, and then all the way up to divine consciousness. Um, Mary says we used martial arts. Michelle says empowering info, very, very good. We got there, oh, no, all the way down to there. Uh, Pedro says love the burger and fries or lasagna, and also lasagna. I have made very delicious lasagnas in my life, like actual Italian food, but I don't make it that much because it is kind of like heavy on the carbs and not how much how I usually eat, but that is special food. And I just want to make sure, <laughs> this is funny, I'm scrolling back, Pedro says, um, there we go, I, I'm, I'm just getting through some of these, okay. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss any of your comments. I think I scrolled. And pardon me if I missed your comments, guys. Good. All right, I think I got everything. Oh, no, I missed this one. This is from Charlie B. Thank you for being here, Sims. Seems tricky to balance awareness and living in this world while also maintaining positive, non-judgmental thoughts. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll speak to that. And then the reply uh, is Michelle agreeing with you. So from my three years of dealing with this direct infestation, I have found that there is a total critical and crucial distinction between being hateful and judgmental and giving accurate criticism. So I can also self-rant against my examples from 10 years ago. Because when I did self-watching 10 years ago, what I would do is sometimes I would be able to see like an implanted thought that's it's unkind, that's not the real me. Like if I'm walking down the street and someone's in front of me and I, there's a thought in my mind that's like, what a huge behind. And I'm like, that's not me. I swear, I wouldn't think that because I know that my thoughts are like emanating outward, but felt very much not the real me. And it was much easier back then for me to distance myself from those thoughts and be like, nope, that's not me. That's a passing thought or some kind of you know un unwelcome invader. Um, but from the past three years with this, this was like having poops put directly into my mind 
that there wasn't a way for me to effectively distance myself from them or non-associate with them. But as I have fought my way to freedom over these past three years through this you know, process of self-augmentation and cosmic augmentation, uh, when I'm in levels of clarity, I'm like, yeah, you know something I can, if, if, wait, wait a second, first I should say, when I was in levels of imprisonment by this stuff and my pineal gland wasn't clear, this stuff does a lot of religious impersonation. And it tries to say like, if you're not a 100% nice saccharinely sweet person, then you deserve to suffer and be attacked by demonic reptilian forces. That's the justification for what they do. And it's kind of like, it's like, be better, be better, be better. And of course, like, God does not improve you that way. God does not improve you. That's just bullying with religious flavors. But when um, I have clarity and I fight the nano effectively, then I don't have to cower and cringe and be like, I hope I'm thinking the right thoughts and I'm not going to get a beat down because I'm not being sweet enough. Sometimes you can be sweet and sometimes you can be salty and sometimes you can be vinegar. And that means sometimes you can think something like that person has a giant fat ass. That's okay. Sometimes you think these thoughts, but usually what I think is not about people's appearance, like, oh, whatever. One of my neighbors was wearing pants that were unflattering. I look outside and I'm like, those are unflattering pants. You're allowed to think that thought. I don't want you to self harm and align with your potential punishers by thinking that that is not an acceptable thing to think. It's totally acceptable. But um, um, what, what, pure, hatred is really not about um, a person's hem length of their pants or size of their rear end. It is really an ad hominem hatred of who they are as a person. So what I receive from both the AI and this stuff and the reptilians and all of these you know, slimy, disgusting things, they simply hate. They simply hate me. You know something, they would hate me if I was wearing this dress. They would hate me if I was wearing a simple black uniform. They hate me with long hair, they hate me with short hair. It's just like, uh, I am Sam, Sam I am. It's like a Dr. Seuss. They would hate you in a box with a fox. They would hate you, hate you no matter what. That is the definition of what ad hominem is. They simply hate. That means there is no way to quote unquote be good enough to not sustain their hatred. And this also speaks to the religious flavor. I call this the techno inquisition because it often erroneously asserts, just be a good person, we won't eat you. Just be a good person, we won't punch you in the face. Just be a good person. You can't ever be good enough for this thing. It is fake. It, it, the, the inquisition was from like dark ages of Northern Europe where they tortured people in order to uh, establish the supremacy of the Christian church. And also they told these people that they were making them better people. I'm making you a better person through torturing you and breaking your bones. And it was totally a lie. It was a fallacious uh, approach. It was really just about torture and misery. This thing is really just about torture and misery. It is not making you a better person. It does not make you have to be better in your community, have to feel better or take more responsibility for your life or your thought patterns or anything like that. It is simply a bully waiting to punch you in the face. And let me also explain the erroneous nature of a concept of a techno inquisition. It, it basically an implantation of a surveillance state, not only watching you from outside of yourself, but from inside of yourself and then punishing you with sad zaps or um, anal electrocution if you do the wrong thing. Like, you thought an unkind thought about a person, now your anus gets electrocuted. Like, that is not how you teach someone. That is not how you achieve spiritual mastery. And then what happens when you remove the threat of anal electrocution? To recidivism. Person goes right back to their regular way of thinking. Like, oh, good. Now that those, uh, you know, horrible mind rapists are gone, now I can think whatever I think. And people revert back to their regular state. There is not a way to torture people into being better people. That's it. So the justification that this thing uses to say, I'm here and I'm evading your planet. Because at a certain, so sometimes it hides. It's like, I'm not here, but then it's here. And you're like, okay, I can see you, you're there. And it says, I'm here, but I'm your friend. And they're like, you're not my friend, you just tortured all these people. And then it says, I'm torturing you for your own good. I'm torturing you into being a better person. And the answer is, you can't do that. 
You cannot torture a person into being a better person. You cannot torture a person into being a better piano player. You cannot torture a person into spiritual growth. You can just torture a person, but that does not make them better or any better than they were. It is simply of benefit to the torturer and the system that thrives on misery, which is a giant mothership that wants to um, siphon misery off of your planet. All right, that's what they are here doing. So. Um, like back to Charlie B's comment over here. The balance between awareness and living in this world and manifesting positive non-judgmental thoughts. So this is big because let's say that you see people in your community who are infested and in alignment with this thing. The techno inquisition would be like, be nice. Don't say anything bad about them. Compliment them on their giant brain slug. Like, what a lovely mind control apparatus you have there. Yes, I am very happy to see that. Like, no, you can't do that. You cannot do that because that's also a betrayal of your soul. Honoring your soul has to do with honesty and authenticity. And if you see that somebody got subcutaneous pollutions and then radically changed their personality and has joined the Borg and is now acting very differently and maybe in an unpleasant way, there is not a nice way to say that. Like there is not a nice way to say like, wow, like you now have like an implantation of like doo-doo crap in your mind and you're not the same person that you once were. There is not a nice way to say that. And you're not required to be sweet and say that. You are required to be honest and authentic to yourself. Look at the amount of freedom that you just felt because I'm telepathic with you guys. When I said that to you, huge burdens of guilt and shame were lifted off of you. Like I'm allowed to feel these feelings. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, well, you know, we're living in invasion of the body snatchers and some of your neighbors got body snatched and it's not a good look on them. And you're allowed to think that thought. Or how about celebrities? When you look at some of these celebrities and like they've totally joined the Borg and they are totally not themselves and they are in the 5D bucket and they think that they're going to have an exalted life in San Junipero. And you look at them and you think that they look ugly or demonically possessed. Like there's just not a nice way to say that. They look ugly and demonically possessed all right and you're allowed to think that you're not going to get techno inquisition bullying and smackdown from me because you think those thoughts so staying positive and non-judgmental i think is the aspect of charlie b's um comment over here um positivity 100 positivity is not required um there an, another way of saying it is that uh negativity is not evil so let's talk about relationship. In relationship, you can be negative. That is when you can say to someone either, what you did hurt me, or I am angry and disappointed for this reason, or this is not acceptable. That is actually not hell, that is heaven. If you've ever lived with a roommate or a housemate, it is essential to be able to communicate those things. Like um, roommate or housemate, you did not do the dishes. And when you do not do the dishes, our kitchen attracts rats and pests. It makes me feel unhappy and uncomfortable. I'm uh, angry at you or disappointed. Can you please fix it? That is essential. And if you have techno inquisition in your mind saying you're not allowed to think bad thoughts, I'll wish you away to the cornfield. Like, you know, you'll, that's from a Twilight Zone episode. You'll get punished if you think bad thoughts. It was a telepathic kid who could read all the adults' minds and all the adults walked around like this, like, la, 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 la. I hope the AI doesn't choose that as my thumbnail. La, la, la. And if you think the wrong thought, the kid's going to wish you away to the cornfield for your punishment. No, actually authentic honesty and communication and sometimes negativity and cr cr critical um, assessment of the relationship is essential in relationship, be it a housemate or a life partner or even dog or cat in your life. Yeah, you can communicate with them. I communicate with Cheeky all the time. It's very rare that we have a conflict, but if we do have a conflict about something, I communicate it to her. I say sometimes you know, this is really not acceptable to me, or this makes me feel this way, or I'm not okay with this, and I say for this reason. And um, the ability to express yourself and set a boundary is heaven. And what these things and the techno inquisition always tried to do to me was to prevent me from setting a boundary. They wanted to not only control my mind and control my behavior, but they wanted me to not be able to say no to things that are unacceptable, especially from the demonically possessed people around me.
So being able to say, hey, it's not a good look, community members got invasion of the body snatchers. And then also to be able to say no to them, like, no, I don't agree to your paradigm. No, I don't uh, want you to act or do that with me. No, I don't want to interact with you. That's essential. And that doesn't make you a bad person. So this is deep stuff about what it is to be an actual galactic citizen versus what is it to be the definition, flawed definition of a Christian good person versus the way that the flawed definition of a Christian good person is being taken and twisted and distorted to be used by bullies in a techno inquisition to um, make you be suppressed and remain in an infantile state. Because if you don't set boundaries, then you're totally stuck in an infantile state. Setting boundaries has everything to do with saying how you wish to be treated and what you feel is totally unacceptable. So if you have a roommate or a housemate, if they don't wash the dishes and you communicate it to them, you're setting a boundary. And if they still don't change, then you say this is totally unacceptable. You can't live here anymore. Because if you don't do that, you know what you do? You accommodate demons. You accommodate, I want to say pander is the word that I'm really looking for. You pander to demons. Demons love it when you pander to them because they are essentially not empowered, semi-alive, you know, stuck beings themselves. So they're not actually very powerful. So they're the very ones who are like, oh, I want to try to get these kings and queens, these uh, immortal gods and goddesses into an infantile disempowered state and then have them they're going to have to kiss my ass if they want to get stuff done. And I'm going to bully them and punch them in the face. Uh, you know, and if, if they want me to stop, they're going to have to kiss my ass to get me to stop. So setting a boundary in your life and saying how you, what you accept and what is acceptable treatment and what is not acceptable treatment, totally appropriate. Even setting a boundary between yourself and benevolent galactic society like Christ. You're allowed to set a boundary with Christ. You're allowed to have a relationship talk with Christ. And this has to do with your own Christ architecture in your body and the larger Christ network of multifaceted um, continuum that you're connected to. You're allowed to say to them, hey, you know, when you allowed my planet to be invaded by this horrible stuff and it came into my pineal gland and I couldn't hear you, I felt very angry and disappointed at you. That is acceptable. Totally, like if Christ arrived, not necessarily in the face of a bearded man, but you know, like if this benevolent society came and reconnected with you, it was like, dun, 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 we're here. Totally acceptable for you to be like, hey guys, you know, when you allowed the subcutaneous pollution campaign to happen and the subversion of all Earth's governments and the decades long campaign of spraying aerosols and nanopollution, I was very angry and disappointed at you. That's called having a relationship. I don't know how many of you, I'm like, I'm not even in a relationship. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving relationship advice and I don't even have like a boyfriend or a husband, but I don't know how many of you have boyfriends, husbands, girlfriends, people in your life that you're committed to. But in any, I have cheeky, of course, in any relationship, you have to be able to be authentic and set boundaries. And that has to do with expressing your genuine feelings and your genuine emotions. And sometimes it is a difficult conversation. Sometimes it is not pretty. So if you had the second coming, dun, dun, and then magical benevolent space aliens came, it would be totally appropriate for you to be like, oh, hi, it's so great that you're here now. Where the F have you been? I am angry and disappointed that you weren't here already. All of these people died because you didn't come earlier. What is wrong with you? You should have protected us from this. Luckily, I gr took the impetus and grew and came into levels of capacitation. And I'm saying this as me, but also as you, every single one of you in this class will say like, hi, benevolent space aliens. You're a little late to the party. Good thing I grew up and kicked ass in this incredible Dis dis disappointing situation. I'm so glad that you're here now. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We got to mute you, girl. Um, totally appropriate to uh, express that in a relationship because otherwise, you know what you have? You have the twilight zone where you're going to get wished away to the cornfield if you make a wrong move. So you're like, hi, everything is fine. Hi, we're so happy to see you. Let's hug. And that's not a real relationship. That's a fake relationship. And you might as well live in San Junipero. I know you got a lot of questions. Wait, let me go over here to your questions all the way down. Uh, oh, wait. 
<laughs> Good. Michelle appreciates the permission slip. Yes, you have my permission slip, but it's really cosmic permission slip because you have these feelings of um, you're allowed to feel your feelings for a reason. Like if you smell rotten milk or whatever, you're like, oh, I'm disgusted by that. It's for a reason. You know, if you feel anger or disappointment in that situation, it's for a reason. And if you tell yourself, no, I must be perfectly happy and fine all the time, like whatever, like some Valium wife from the 1970s. Um, no, that's not real. That's not the real you. You have feelings and emotions for a reason, especially even including negative emotions. Um, and Mary says they are attacking humans now ferociously through our companions and pets. Yeah, it's a, bit, a big backlash. So the spiritual battle is very, very harsh right now. And um, as much as um, myself and many others are fighting valiantly in order to clear the technology, clear the astral realms or the realms of pure thought form and to um, capacitate ourselves and clear our biology, there's a ton of backlash. So please know that that uh, happens. And sometimes it can be simple like fleas you know, um, but that can be a form of attack. This is a beautiful comment. Charlie B says in bold letters, thank you, Aurora, for sharing your direct insights and for the FRL that provides an opportunity for us to return to divine factory settings. You are so welcome. And thank you for the Gatorade. Definitely helped me to keep going on the marathon. And it is my cosmic job joy to do this. And it is, I hope you can tell from my, I think this whole his whole lecture today has been a semi rant, um, but worthy. Um, I hope you can tell from my attitude and from my approach that um, I am glad and joyful to be here in a effing war under horrible conditions with you guys because I would rather be here being capacitated and doing something than being in a higher dimensional state. Like, I'm looking at things, but I can't really get stuff done. And I'm just going to wish that things are going to get better. I'm like, I'm there. I'm doing it. I Again, I wouldn't have it any other way. I am very, very pleased to be here in a physicality presence where I can have a direct impact on what is happening in this incredibly unfair situation. and. Um, be as protective as I can and to give you the empowerment as much as I possibly can because um, I don't just want to be like a protective umbrella for you guys. I want you guys all to deploy your own umbrellas and that is the factory settings. That is the reactivation of dormant potentials in your DNA to defend and protect yourselves and your own planet. You guys can and should kick ass. Yes. And so everything about what's happened to make you domesticated humans took you away from your feral nature in freedom and neutered you. Um, you get to be wild and free again. It's going to be awesome. Yes. Um, Mary says, I am doing something about it. I'm so pleased for that too. I love that attitude. Michelle says, attitude of gratitude. I don't know what LFG is. LFG fire FRL. And Mary says, thank you for coming to aid us. You're very, very welcome. Again, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm, I'm very pleased. I do actually get a huge level of, I would say, cosmic support in being able to do this. Michelle says, let's fucking go. That's with a GG, so don't worry if there's little kids listening. Um, freaking go. Um, like I said, whenever I need to get something done and it seems like it's more than my present level of spiritual muscle power can do it, I get the capacity to do it. And I would consider, I get the budget. I would consider that to be a huge amount of cosmic support. So I don't know the story of what's going on with Christ, angelic benevolence, and all these other things. I don't know why, what's the hold up, why things haven't been more effective or why they haven't helped more directly, or why they haven't helped more, or how the situation could even have happened. I don't know. I don't know. And I won't pretend to make a story about that. All I know is when things are very, very perilous and I need to get something done, I get the energetic budget to get it done. And I call that a huge amount of cosmic support because it's like the, you know, the cosmic energy bank account is recognizing that I need to be able to do that. And I wanna just um, extend that to you. You should extrapolate that to your own lives, that if you need to get something done, the way will be provided. The energy will arrive. Your inner 
capacities will come, come alive. It, it has to happen. And also, and this is actually, I think, a good thing for me to complete upon for today. It's been a very good, long, ranty lecture. Um, what we are doing is creating a biological architecture on this planet that can stand up to this stuff and to the galactic AI that has been going around mowing down planets, mowing down galaxies. The AI is a very jalopy, inefficient system that needs to constantly have an influx of like more emotion, more hatred, more death, like it needs to keep on consuming just in order to maintain a general level of um, homeostasis. And so this is, we're not the first planet that's been attacked. It's got a lo long laundry list of um, things that it's destroyed. And what we are doing right now here, and especially with flying rainbow lasagna, is creating the biological architecture that has the fortitude to stand up to and to destroy and dismantle this stuff. We are not gonna fall. We are not only not gonna fall, not gonna go in the 5D bucket and San Junipero, but we are going to dismantle the whole entire system that has been trying to destroy galaxies. That is the real meaning of your life and of your existence and being here. It's not just like you should be having a cool, fun, super fruity ascension experience and instead you got this uh, war-torn, you know, um, minimal, um, mediocre existence here. It's not just that. You're also similarly here for a reason and your suffering has um, a significance in what you are forming into as you awaken your dormant potentials. These bodies have the capacity to not just withstand AI but to fight back against it destroy it, conquer it, remove it from existence. And that is what we do. That's it. I don't have anything more to say. If there's any more questions or comments, I'm happy to speak to them. If not, I'm going to go take care of my dog. One more comment. Michelle says, Young Guns movie says, um, reg regulators mount up, going to mount up, getting my steed and my saddle ready. I'm very, very pleased to hear that. Interest says mic drop. Exactly. That is it. That is it. I don't know. I don't know the young guns, but um, there's something about the old west and uh, people who were deputized because there was not uh, law enforcement and there was rampant criminality. And that is very much what is going on here right now. You must rise to the occasion and also please know that so these uh, advancements in your body, you get to be even more than you were in ancient concurrent Atlantis. You have to be, because that level of reality is imperiled, that brought you to here, and then this level of reality is imperiled, and you're not going down, so you have to be more than you were in that time, and you were a lot in that time. So rest restoration to factory settings, and also more. You also get plus, whatever, whatever that amounts to. So uh, yeah, I think that I've done an effective um, job in this presentation of turning it around from a sense of disempowered victimhood and shaking your fist at the sky at the unfairness of it all into self-empowerment. If someone else isn't doing their job, you take their job. Snap, you take their job and you do it and know that you will receive the capacitations and the augmentations to be able to do whatever needs to be done. And Allison says, we got this. Yes, we certainly do. All right. So good. Beautiful work today, everyone. Allison says, thanks, Aurora. Hope Cheeky feeling better soon. I'm going to go hug her right now because she didn't even want to eat a cookie. That is not like her. I know. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm profoundly grateful to be here, to be doing this class, to connect with you. as a, a, You are an amazing group of people. And I include the people that regularly watch on YouTube because I know that there's a very nice... Um, group of people that regularly watch and comment on my videos there and I see you working your ass off I see you growing I see you being incredibly courageous recognition flows to you encouragement flows to you and yes we will triumph over all of this thank you thank you very much